discussing the history of the party with the chairman, as well as other party and movement veterans. The party's history, one with rich, uncompromising struggle, is not being reviewed today for the sake of preserving memories. It is to be embraced and inherited by us to bring this revolution to its successful conclusion. It is my honor now to introduce our leader and founder, being the reason for such history, Chairman Omali Yeshitela. Uhuru. Uhuru. Uhuru, comrade. I want to thank you, uh, Comrade Director Akile, uh, for introducing this study. Uh, the study today, uh, just like it was stated in the material that was sent to you, uh, is on uh, Chapter 5. Uh, the history of uh, the party, and it comes from the political report to the Sixth Congress of the African People's Socialist Party. And it begins uh, this chapter that the development of our party has been dialectical, containing within it the history and struggle of African people from the past, which informs our understanding of the present and our projections for the future. Our party emerged in 1972 from the actual resistance of Africans fighting colonial domination in the US and in Africa. Our ideological trajectory comes directly from our attempts to solve the real, pressing, practical problems confronting our movement against imperialist white power. That's the beginning. That's the first uh, paragraph on chapter five, the history of our party. But what I want to do on today is uh, to help us understand that the history of the party is a, is a living history. It's a dynamic living history. It's not just some words that's written down on paper. Uh, and there are people who are in the party, associated with the party. Uh, and some, of, some have been here uh, since the party's inception. And I think that what would be helpful is for us to have actual discussion with some of these people who have been here, who participated in the struggles of the party, who helped to give shape and definition of what the African People's Socialist Party is. Uh, and this is something that's gone on uh, now uh, for a couple of generations. And uh, we have with us uh, 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 on the phone, or who are accessible to us, Comrade Vince Lawrence, who was with the Black Rights Fighters, one of the three organizations that came together and in 1972 formed the African People's Socialist Party. Uh, he is in Fort Myers, uh, Florida. Uh, there is Comrade Secretary General Louisa Kinshasa, who is located in London and who has worked uh, with the party for a number of years, both uh, in England and throughout uh, Europe and in some places on the continent of Africa. Uh, there's Comrade Tafari Mugera, uh, who uh, is located in occupied Zania, commonly known as South Africa, who has also had uh, experiences uh, with the party. And there is uh, a convergent uh, participation in the party uh, between uh, Comrade Tafari uh, and the comrades in South Africa and Comrade Louisa Kinshasa. Uh, there uh, on the phone is Comrade Gaida Kambon, uh, who has been a member of the party uh, since uh, uh, around 1980, 81. Uh, uh, there's Comrade uh, Bakri uh, Olatunji uh, in Oakland, California, uh, who uh, worked with uh, the party at critical moments and in fact was the person who uh, as a nurse working at Highland Hospital in Oakland, California uh, gave me the phone call uh, uh, early uh, in the morning uh, that they brought Hugh P. Newton into the hospital after he had been assassinated. Uh, Bakri also uh, along with Comrade Gaida at the time played a fundamental role in uh, the uh, Bobby Hutton African People's Free Clinic that we uh, established in Oakland. Uh, and uh, there's Comrade Omawale K. Fing, uh, who uh, we, we, we met uh, and who introduced us to the Desi Woods struggle uh, in, in the 1970s and with whom 
uh, organized uh, all over the state of Georgia and some of the most dangerous places, and not just Georgia, but we travel and work together uh, throughout the South in particular, and <laughs> who had some interesting experiences uh, working uh, for the party uh, in the northern U.S. as well. Uh, there's Chimaringa uh, Silambayo, who has been in the party since he uh, was 17 years old, and that was uh, actually he came into the Uhuru movement during the Jomo era, uh, which makes him, uh, you know, a relatively well-seasoned uh, person. And Chimaringa is here, and there's Comrade uh, Penny Hess, uh, whom I've known uh, well, not since I've known, uh, but who has uh, been a part of this work. She is the chairwoman of the African People's Solidarity uh, Committee. Uh, she has been involved uh, as a part of uh, APSC since its founding in 1976. So these are some of the people who are available to us and who will participate in this discussion. Again, uh, because the, the history of the party is a living history, it's dynamic, and what I want to do, because uh, I'm starting um, sort of uh, uh, later on in this, in terms of party participation and membership, because uh, I need to start in, in South Africa, occupied of Zania. Uh, is Tafari on yet? He's, you don't think he's on yet? Okay, so what we'll do then is, uh, uh, I'm trying to get an indication of whether Tafari's on. We were trying to go early with him because it's very, very expensive, his participation on this call is very expensive, and uh, so we wanted to uh, go ahead and allow him to say some things early on um, to defray uh, some of the cost. Mm -hmm. And as I understand it, he is coming on shortly. Um, um, I want to say that I read the first uh, paragraph in uh, chapter uh, five in the history of the party, and the second chapter reads, uh, our history is based on the most radical activist sector of what is popularly known as the civil rights movement. Unlike the civil rights movement and organizations whose focus was on changing or reforming America, ours was a selfish motivation to win the liberation of African people led by the African working class regardless of its consequences for America or any other power. This is uh, the second paragraph uh, in uh, the opening of uh, chapter five. Our party was born of the brutal repression that destroyed our movement for happiness <clears throat> and the return of our stolen resources in the 1960s. Our mission was defined in part by that repression. We were the living embodiment of the words of Fred Hampton, Black Panther Party leader murdered by U.S. agents on December 4th, 1969. Quote, you can kill a revolutionary, but you can't kill the revolution. So, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and move forward now. I don't think uh, Tafari is, is Taf Tafari's not on yet, is he? So what I would like to do is, you know, uh, in 1972, uh, the, the JOMO, the Hunter Militant Organization, the organization that I led at the time, that was based in St. Petersburg, Florida, Louisville, and Lexington, Kentucky, um, uh, had begun organizing uh, for African Liberation Day, the first African Liberation Day to occur. <clears throat> and I was a part of the uh, National Steering Committee of the African Liberation Day Coordinating Committee. And uh, I was uh, organizing throughout the state of Florida uh, to win participation. And I was working with uh, 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 comrades uh, from uh, Gainesville, Florida, uh, the uh, Gainesville Black Study Group that was headed by, uh, by uh, Katura Carey, and, uh, which was an organization mostly of, of uh, students and, uh, and uh, uh, intellectuals. And then uh, there was the Black Rights Fighters down in Fort Myers that was headed by uh, Comrade uh, uh, Lawrence Mann, who uh, and, and, and they did work primarily uh, with migrant workers uh, throughout the South. There was a splendid uh, uh, a group of forces that came together and then uh, in the process of building ALD uh, also determined that we would 
uh, organize uh, the African People uh, Socialist Party. And this is after a number of years of, by, the, by Jomo of uh, working to try to pull together a party. But this was the, the uh, opportune time and the best time. And it was on the tail end of the defeat of the Black Revolution. And uh, Comrade Vince Lawrence was a member of the Black Rights Fighters. And I was wondering, is, is Vince on? Do we know if Vincent Lawrence is on? Are you there, Vincent? So Vincent is not here either. So, but Chimarang was here for a lot of this time. Let's go to Chimarang and he can talk to us uh, because he was there during the, the, the Jomo era and uh, saw the development and participated in the development of the party as well. Uhuru Chimarenga, you, yeah, let's talk. I mean, I, I, you know, the thing is that we want to present the party to the people, but as I said, it's a dynamic history. It's not just, you know, stuff written in books. People had real experiences and, and uh, there were real problems that the movement, the struggle was trying to solve uh, at every instance. Uh, each person we are talking to uh, was participating. Can you say anything about your participation? I think you were in high school, well, you were in high school when you came yeah, into the Hura movement, but, yeah. uh, but the party would, would be founded a few years later. Yeah. yeah. I graduated in 69, so mm -hmm. the party was founded three years later, but I always uh, see the party as uh, really the development of Jomo in 1968. I think that uh, that crucial development in the city of St. Petersburg, and you mentioned the uh, merging of three organizations that became the African People's Socialist Party, but I think Joe Mo really had, uh, uh, was the uh, kind of the glue that, that brought all of that together. And uh, I think it was instrumental in the African liberation movement uh, two years before the founding of Jomo, uh, we know that uh, you had tore down that uh, despicable mural in City Hall, and I think all of that was uh, the, the predecessor to the African People's Socialist Party. I think it was, it was just writing the book to get to the building of the African People's Socialist Party, and I believe uh, Jomo needs to be mentioned in any discussion about the founding of the African People's Social Support. I think Jomo is a really important part of that because four years of really important work, garbage workers strike uh, in St. Petersburg, Florida, which uh, Jomo uh, Hunter Militant Organizations had a really important uh, role in, uh, really built itself off of the uh, sanitation workers strike I think it, so many important struggles happened. Uh, Anti-war demonstrations happened. Statewide anti-war demonstrations happened in the city of St. Petersburg. So I think Jomo is such a crucial uh, era and crucial organization in the building of the African liberation movement, not just in Florida, but in this country, that it, it shouldn't go unstated. So that's, that's what I would... Uh, contribute. What I want to say is that I'm, I'm going to ask people uh, how do people participate because I do want people to be able to raise questions and comments and things like that to the, to the presenters. And uh, I'm going to move beyond uh, Comrade Chimaringa, but there's some things I want to come back to and just in terms of the living you know, aspect of this because he mentioned things like anti-war mobilizations and things like that. And uh, there's some interesting history that's associated with our participation in there. But uh, I know that Tafari is now on the line uh, in Occupied Azani or South Africa. So I'd like to go in immediately to Tafari um, because there, um, we had our own um, specific kind of uh, experiences uh, working there. Uh, I and the party, uh, including uh, comrades uh, Omawale K. Fing, um, began working with, and, and you know, some of the uh, older veterans began working with the Pan-Africanist Congress of Azania uh, in, in the 1970s. Uh, we did a lot of work with them, uh, particularly uh, 
in, in Atlanta, Georgia, but we also uh, worked, participated, and spoke, at, uh, um, spoke for them uh, uh, at the United Nations. We participated in most of the debates and discussions within the uh, expatriate uh, uh, community of Africans uh, who had been expelled from, chased out of uh, South Africa, or who had left on their own uh, to initiate uh, armed struggle going back into the country. And uh, so we had begun working with the Pan-Africanist Congress of Azania. And we were working with PAC, uh, as, as it is known, uh, because as compared to the African National Congress that was led uh, by Nelson Mandela uh, uh, nominally, and um, because uh, it was clear to us in terms of the political line that PAC uh, had come into existence as a part of a split with a, from the ANC, uh, revolving around the question of the land. And the land issue in South Africa was then and continues to be like the fundamental contradiction around which many of the other um, uh, contradictions revolve. And so we were able to unite with PAC because PAC uh, took a stance around the land. Uh, and then uh, I think it was 1994, uh, we also participated in the debates leading up to the so-called end of the apartheid form of the, of the state in South Africa. Uh, we opposed the negotiated uh, settlement that happened. Uh, I, I don't know now uh, which of the forces did unite with it, but apparently it was something that uh, satisfied the uh, aspirations of a lot of the people who were involved in, in from South Africa. And uh, so PAC left uh, the U.S. and went back uh, to South Africa. And we lost contact, uh, direct uh, political contact with them up until uh, 2000 or shortly thereafter, uh, when at that time the new uh, Secretary General, uh, Tommy Platke, uh, uh, was able to contact uh, our comrades in London and and uh, it resulted in my speaking in 2002 at the 8th Congress of the Pan-Africanist Congress of Azania in uh, Mtata. Uh, and we were trying to work with the Pan-Africanist Congress of Azania more, more directly through its youth wing uh, that seemed to be you know, more progressive and seemed to be uh, really interested in trying to complete the revolutionary project. Uh, and that uh, turned to naught. And so uh, it became clear that we had to build on the ground uh, the party there and wherever else we could. And Comrade Tafari and the young comrades who uh, uh, worked with him and revolve around uh, his leadership uh, answered the call. And they have been uh, doing remarkable work in occupied Zania, South Africa, uh, uh, as it's you know, known um, in terms of its colonial characterization. And so Comrade Tafari is with us now. And I just wanted uh, Tafari to be able to talk about this. And again, we, we talk about a real live and dynamic history. You know, that's how we want to contextualize this discussion. You know, the kinds of struggles, the events, the things that uh, influenced us and how we've been trying to move with this. And we are asking people who are participating uh, in this study, you can, you can uh, as usual, you can make your comments, your, you, know, you can intervene, you can raise questions, and we try to have the comrades who, who are presenters, presenters uh, contribute uh, uh, to that. I think that can make for a much more dynamic uh, study. So, Uhuru, Tafari. Are you there, Tafari? Are you on mute, Tafari? I know we're trying to do this uh, so that, because it's expensive, and I wanted to, I don't want to hold Tafari on that long. So I'm hoping that uh, we can get right to it. Otherwise, I'm going to have to go uh, to someone else. Uh, perhaps we can begin this discussion with Comrade Luezi, uh, because Comrade Luezi, Uhuru, is that the fire? Yes, it was. Uhuru, Comrade Luezi, 
Yeah, I was uh, just, uh, you know, wanted to talk about the, the, the South Africa work and building the party and the work that the party is doing there. Uh, we, for some reason, seem not to be able to connect directly to Tafari. Um, uh, so, um, perhaps you can go ahead and introduce this discussion, uh, Comrade Louise, unless, that would, would that have been Tafari? Tafari, are you there? Yeah, it's him. It's Tafari? Yes, it is. I heard his voice. But I, we can't hear Uhuru, him here. Uhuru, 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 so we, we were waiting on you to, uh, you know, we're just waiting on you to talk about uh, your introduction to the party and, and, and how the, the political context and everything of the work that you're doing, what's going on there, how the party is uh, building uh, that kind of activity. If you could, please. Uhuru, Uhuru comrade, um, I'd like to first uh, salute uh, the chairman and salute uh, SGBUZ and the leadership of the Adventist Village Party. Um, I am Tafari, I am in Ogita Lazania, and we are building the African People's Village Party, Ogita Lazania, and other constituent organizations of the Uhuru movement, such as Impidam. Um, uh, if I were to talk about myself right now, my introduction into the party and how that has impacted on me. Um, firstly, I have to mention that I was born in one of the townships of South Africa. And uh, if you know the history of the townships of South Africa, they were really created uh, to, to have a reserve of African workers who go and work and produce and produce material wealth for the colonizers. And we are still locked up in, into these um, townships even today, in, uh, in 2018. So um, I also want to mention that I am I'm only 25 years old right now, which means I was born in 1993. And this is just about when Nelson Mandela uh, was about to become the, the first uh, black president of South Africa. And he correctly uh, uh, called the black the first black president of South Africa because uh, he, he, he nearly took over the, the administrative seat uh, of the same settler colonial state that has been that was established, formally established in 1910 um, when the two um, colonizers, the Dutch, the settler Dutch and the British decided to resolve their contradictions after the first anglo war and the second anglo war they decided that they should stop. Actually, these were the words of one of their leaders, uh, Jan Smart. If you know Jan Smart, he was one of the people who, were, who organized the, the League of Nations after the First World War. He said that white people, the Dutch, settler Dutch, and the, and the British should stop fighting amongst each other in a land that is full of barbarians. So they had to establish the state of South Africa in order to... Um, to oppress uh, the African masses without having to fight uh, among each other. So um, I was born in the township of South Africa, and for us, especially being born uh, around the time when, when the new colonial rule well, was established here in, in South Africa, we were, to, we were totally removed out of political life. Our parents were not political at all. The only way we could be political was through voting. Just like uh, there's going to be general elections next year. Um, and people, the African working class, would go in the polls and, and vote. And after voting, they have to sit and wait for the petty bourgeois new colonialists to, uh, to write their policies, many, many documents, and then you can't even interpret the documents. They don't even speak to us. And then we wait after five or four years and then go and vote again. So the African working class right now is not political at all. So that's how I, I grew up. That is the context in which I grew in. And um, I don't know. I don't know if it, it was about me or perhaps maybe I, I got a chance to be exposed to, to some kind of, 
of me for me to express myself as an African or my blackness. Uh, and the quickest way for me or the most uh, available means was through Rastafari. I became a Rastafari because there was a black God, a black Jesus. And that was the only way I could really say I am an African. I could be proud of myself because there was nothing else to be proud of around in the community. We lived in, in shacks, uh, no car roads, uh, you don't really get uh, no electricity. So, and this is um, in, the, in, in the 21st century, and we have a, a black government. But these people are getting rich and rich and richer. Chabon Becky, Nelson Mandela, getting famous, popular all over the world, but the condition for the African working class has not really changed. So this is where I was born. And I never conceptualized the idea of being political. For us, actually, when we came into the party around um, 2013, or came into the movement through S.G. Nwezi, who has been our teacher since, um, we... We did not like the, the, the idea of, of, of a party. Uh, we asked, why does it have to be called a party? Because we identify a, I identify a party with being corrupt. If it's a party, it means uh, you only uh, want votes from the masses after getting the votes. You go to parliament, you get a salary from parliament, and then you are able to, uh, to open your, your channels to get more and more and more money. That's what we knew about politics. We do not understand that everything uh, is, is, is politics. And the fact that um, they decide for us how many houses, uh, these matchbox houses we should get, when and how, uh, was, was a political uh, thing. We did not understand that. We thought maybe this is just where we are. And all we have to do is to work harder. Maybe perhaps we are lazy. Because uh, that's what the ANC tells the people, every time when people are oppressed, the ANC tells people that it's their fault, that maybe they're not uh, studying hard enough, or they're not working hard enough, or they're not using the opportunities that the, the new dispensation in uh, so-called democracy has uh, provided for black people. But when we say black people, they're really talking about uh, the, the black middle class, those who are able to go to university, which is only a few people, because even those who study hard and get good grades, they cannot have access to these universities since the, the, the fees are high and they get excluded, financially excluded on that basis for being black and poor. So so when, when I went to university, I met Asa, Asa Anku. Uh, he's one person who really impressed me uh, in the whole campus for really talking, challenging the lecturers, asking them questions in, in, in a little class about Egypt. Uh, because they wanted to pay Egypt as an Arab or a white uh, creation, like the, the civilization of Egypt, they could not, there was, they never quoted check until job anywhere until we graduated. So as I was someone who challenged them, and I, I approached him, and then uh, together we got, uh, we discovered videos of, uh, of Chen and Mali, if you tell her, on, online, on YouTube, uh, we were really excited, we listened to them, and uh, we got more videos of uh, people like um, Kwame Ture um, and, and, and uh, historians such as um, John Henry Clark, but it was the African People's Socialist Party and Kemi Nomali um that really uh, told us that we must get organized. It is not enough to get all this information and they go around um, teaching people or acting smarter than, than, than everyone else. We really have to organize. We have to organize. And this is around the time when the ESS that was founded by, 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 by Julius Malema from after being expelled from the, from the ANC, this was like the most radical thing that was uh, that is just made in our eyes. But we knew who Julius Malema was, and we knew the kind of politics that these people were pushing. Even the students themselves who were, in, who were attracted to these political parties uh, were, were arrogant people uh, who really did not respect the African working class in the city, poor Africans, homeless Africans. They did not respect these Africans. So it was the African People's Socialist Party, the Uhuru Movement, 
uh, that really attracted us because it really taught us to, to, to humble ourselves, uh, for us not to be big headed after studying. Even when we go back to the country, um, we went there to learn from the people and to get from the people what can be done in order for us to, to overturn the, 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 the situation that we, um, that, that we are locked up into. And another thing that I really want to mention that stood out for, for me personally, because when, when Arthur was begging with me to really show me how important it is for us to get organized and relatable with the African working class was, was the question of Pan-Africanism um, and African internationalism or versus African internationalism. Um, I thought they were the same. I really thought they were the same. No, maybe you just have a few differences here or maybe there's just an extension or or something like that. It took me a while because I was I was lazy and I was busy with other things in, in the university. I could not really appreciate enough the the, the magnitude of, of, the, of the science that is interested in African internationalism. I did not get that chance because I was blinded by my activities inside university, organizing students to study and debate. But African internationalism taught, taught me and, and, and the comrades who are working here on the ground that the essential feature of capitalism is parasitism. We did not yet know that, and I've not heard that anywhere else. I do hear people talking about uh, uh, capitalism, uh, developing into barbarism, becoming parasitic, and things like that. But no one says that the essential feature of uh, capitalism is parasitism, which really helps us here um, to know that there's a, there's a class war that is really based on that relationship of parasitism because the African petty bourgeoisie, they tell us here in Parazania and everywhere else in the world that we are all black. And yesterday I had a debate, actually there was just an argument with someone on WhatsApp from some organization here, trying to convince me that no, the primary contradiction is colonialism, which means that we must just fight the white man and pardon all other, uh, the, 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 the the comprador, the bourgeois, the bourgeois, you must just pardon them. They have to loot. They can just loot as much as they want to loot because they are not looting as much as the white man is looting. But for us, we, the African People's Socialist Party and African internationalism has really um, taught us that no one has a right to exploit the African working class. No one has a right to exploit the, the, the poor black masses whether you are black or you are white. And the African petty bourgeoisie, uh, those who came to be our leaders, but they make deals with whoever is available for them to cater their interests. Um, they, 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 they partake. They are conscious participants in the whole parasitic social system that oppresses the masses of, of the African working class. So this is one thing that stood out for us and this is something that no one can challenge right now i can say with confidence that there is no one who can debate and challenge african internationalism even on facebook wherever we go most of them they even avoid talking to us because they know that they cannot challenge african internationalism they cannot challenge african internationalism and <coughs> And also being someone who was who was a student and having graduated and, uh, and and working, I understand that whatever I am, because I I, and I work with the the bourgeoisie, and they think that they pay taxes. They, they say some things like, "No, we uh, these people they want three houses." Talking about the African working class, um, but these 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 are our taxes. They feel that they they're the ones who who pay taxes to the state, for the state uh, to give free things to the African working class who are, who are lazy, according to them. But they don't understand that uh, the class, the social um, force that is responsible for all the material wealth, the material value that is produced in the world and in South Africa is the African working class who go to the mines, who go to the factories, uh, who go to, uh, to the farms, and everywhere where real production uh, takes place. 
These are the people who produce everything that these teachers, these lawyers, these doctors enjoy. Uh, everything that they enjoy with white people comes from the sweat of the African working class. This is something that, uh, that, that really moves us and makes us to be grounded in African internationalism. And also, inside university, we, we met a lot of people who we tried to win into African internationalism. That because students are aspiring to the bourgeoisie, uh, some of them were with us for a while, but after realizing that their sacrifices to be made uh, with being with the, with the world movement and being an African internationalist, they, they ditched us. We have, we have worked with a lot of people, but after graduating, they leave, they go and work in white, white law firms, they go and work in uh, some engineering companies, and they don't want to hear about us anymore. The only thing they do is to go on Facebook and debate about what's what being black, uh, Kwanzaa, or uh, religion, and all these things. But they don't want to work. They don't even want to see themselves in the country. And this is where we are in. All the units that we need in Tanzania of the African People's Socialist Party, they are in the country right now. But we, are, we are organizing. And African internationalism is more appreciated in the country than it is appreciated in, appreciated in the universities and other places that are created in the city by the African city bourgeoisie. This is something that we have got to experience. And, and, and for, for, for us, or for, for me personally, the idea of class suicide, I am really glad that um, I got introduced to it and exposed to it before even uh, graduating into the pedagogical class. I really appreciate that because I cannot imagine myself uh, being someone who's complicit with the, with the exploitation and oppression of the African working class. These are my parents. My father was someone who worked for white people. My mother worked for, 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 for white people and we've been producing for white people ever since. So I have to go beyond myself. Actually, one thing that I also am coming into is that the, the idea of sacrifice, in a feeling that when you join the Evolutionary Party and having to commit love suicide is some kind of sacrifice. For me, right now, it's not even really uh, a, 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 a sacrifice. It's something that is in me. I, I, I enjoy it. I enjoy being uh, with the proletariat. I enjoy being uh, a communist. I enjoy being someone who, who doesn't bear having uh, many cars, uh, a very uh, ridiculously big house uh, and all these things that I don't need. I don't feel like I am, I'm missing something in my life. The only thing that I'm missing is freedom. Uh, I am missing uh, being able to, to have someone from Kenya uh, who's a comrade to visit me as they wish or for me to go wherever I want, where my people are. So I'm missing. I'm not missing uh, so, so, so. So, so, so some kind of fun that is, that is attached to, to making deals with capitalism at the expense of the African working class and the toiling African masses. So that, that's what is happening. And for us especially, most of us, speaking for myself and Comrade Asa, Muhao, uh, Sia, Kemba, and, and, and Zika, everyone else who we are working with here in the future of Zania, all of us are new to politics, and I think one of the reasons we are new to politics is because we did not want to join these political parties that exist in Mokhi Barazana. We didn't want to join the, the, the ANC or the PAC uh, in the state that is being ever since I was born. Uh, we don't want to join the EFS because we know all of them. They don't want to declare themselves as parties of the African working class. Some of them talk about socialism. But they don't declare that they fight for the perfect interest of the African working class, which should be the basis of actually black, black unity. If they talk about black unity, then they have to commit class suicide. Right but they talk about black unity for the class, for the African working class, to support their black businesses, uh, or to call them black excellence, or to celebrate them after graduation. But they don't want to do anything 
for the African working class. They don't even want to uh, to accept or to even acknowledge the fact that everything that they're about uh, to accept, even the loans that they take with the banks for them to have the cars, uh, the houses, those loans, they come uh, from the economic base of slavery and colonialism. They don't want to accept that. But they'll say they love black people and they want to be with black people. So I think where we are right now, we, we, we are so confident and we have learned to be confident because most of us, shy people, uh, we don't have enough confidence, especially being uh, coming from the township. You don't have the right accent. Uh, you are not so fluent in English. But we don't care because we, we have African internationalism. African internationalism is so easy to understand for African workers. We teach African internationalism in, in local languages, in African languages. We don't have to use English uh, to teach African internationalism because this is something that uh, the African working class live with on a daily basis. They go to work every day. They can't speak uh, very late. They don't they can't even have their kids with the homework. Some, some of them, they don't even see their children because every time when they come back home, the kids are sleeping and the kids are sleeping. This is how we explain African internationalism. So we have actually even learned what it means to be in an organization. Plans of action. And this, is, this has been a real struggle for, for some of us. Knowing how to, how to draw a, a plan of action or in that simply to say that the actual plan of action is there is something that you are working on. We did not know about the, those things. We did not know about um, many concepts. Democratic centralism, we did not know about that. Most of us uh, said, like, no, we'll just maybe um, agree on one thing. Somehow we'll just all agree on the same thing all the time. We'll just go outside and do one thing, come back the next day, the same thing. And African internationalism, the African Socialist Party, has helped us to really go beyond, beyond ourselves. Um, and this is really helping us to really fight a genuine, a genuine cause. Uhuru. I want to thank you. I thank really you. appreciate <laughs> yeah, Uhuru. 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 Thank you, Comrade Tafari. I thought that's splendid. Uh, and uh, are, we, are people commenting at all yet on what, is, what he has to say? Yeah. What are we hearing? People are just saluting right now. That's great. And uh, so we're hearing from uh, Comrade Tafari, and, and they're extraordinarily busy. They, uh, <coughs> uh, we are working in, in uh, several of the different provinces in, uh, in South Africa, occupied Azania, um, and uh, are growing. And anybody who uh, keeps up with social media can see uh, uh, Tafari <coughs> regularly, and also Comrade Asa and the, the the classes that they're doing right in the townships where people are learning right there, the African working class, African internationalism being taken to people right on the ground. That is party style of work. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's really powerful. And I'm, I'm going to be asking that people do comment as we move forward. I want to, uh, uh, to go ahead and, and uh, have other discussion. Uh, I want to know, is Vince Lawrence on now? Uhuru, yes, come back, Gaida. Go ahead. Uhuru, Chairman, I just wanted to really um, salute Comrade uh, Tafari. Um, and this is Comrade uh, Gaida Kambon, uh, uh, veteran of the party, uh, been in the party at least since around 1981, at, you know, somewhere. 81. 81? Yeah, go ahead, come back. Go ahead, come back, Gaida. But it, it, it is just it is mind-boggling just to see this happening because I remember, Chairman, that you always said that in Africa, South Africa was key to, you know, to, you know, African internationalism because it was up, up, up its development um, and how strategic it was to what we were doing. And I remember the party um, really struggling to find the correct forces. I remember at our Congress, um, that we invite, one year we had a brother from Blomfontein, I guess I'm saying, I hope I'm saying it right. Yeah. Blomfontein, Sobani, um, 
you know, uh, turned out to be not really what we were looking for, but that we were always constantly struggling to find the right forces, and I think we're there right now, just listening to Comrade Safari. It's just a magnificent achievement for the party. It's really very, very important for what we're doing. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Comrade uh, Gaida. And I agree with you 100%. I do remember the brother who came to the Congress, and uh, I think he was a member of some kind of Communist Party in South Africa and had a... And we need to, to mute. If you're not speaking, comrade, please mute your phone if you're not speaking. Please mute. Yeah, thank you. But yeah, I remember, I remember that comrade, uh, uh, Gaida. We had a lot of aspirations, uh, uh, always, because we recognize uh, South Africa uh, is strategic, and just in terms of the fact that the white people stayed there, they've had the advantage of, of uh, the resources that come from all, of, all over Africa and all over the world that were concentrated in the white communities, and in South Africa, that's the case as well. So while there is often this attempt to prove the superiority of white people because of what the whites have done in South Africa compared to the Africans, what they're not saying is the whites in South Africa are part of a whole uh, uh, imperialist colonial nation that stretches across the globe that benefits from resources sucked out of South Africa from all over Africa and from other oppressed peoples around the world, and that's the thing that's propped them up. So not some special genius of some minority uh, white uh, people in South Africa, but the total uh, imperialist white nation is what held them up. Uh, Uhuru, come at Akile, yeah. Uhuru, um, so as was stated, there's you know comments saluting uh, Comrade Tafari and Deputy Chair Onazan Chatella um, commented, Uhuru, African internationalism is a theory of the African working class and can be learned in many African languages. Thank you, Chairman Tafari. And she also um, asked a question to Chairman um, about, can you speak about class suicide? That's what, Deputy Chair? Uhuru. Well, class suicide. Uh, we recognize that the existence of classes, there are some people in the African movement that sometimes calls itself the African liberation movement or calls itself the black left, <laughs> et cetera. Uh, they recognize the oppression of black people in general. And that's, everybody can recognize that. Even a black millionaire can talk about black people catching hell and being oppressed. <clears throat> and so the struggle for national liberation for the whole nation is an ongoing struggle, and it does involve uh, different classes. It liquidates the class question, and that's what the problem that many have is because they represent the African petty bourgeoisie. They see the world through the eyes of the petty bourgeoisie, so when they say black people be being free from their perspective, the interest of the black petty bourgeoisie is the interest of all the black people. So, but that's not the case because the African petty bourgeoisie, a middle class, can satisfy its material and not just material, but even, for lack of a better term, spiritual uh, uh, aspirations uh, uh, and leave the rest of us behind. How do we know that's true? All you got to do is look at the continent of Africa where the black petty bourgeoisie fighting in the name of black people, Africans, achieve what's supposed to be independence. Look at South Africa, if you will. Look at our communities throughout the country inside the United States. You see the African petty bourgeoisie. They are the only ones who have benefited from the struggles that's been made by poor, oppressed people who face war dogs, uh, water, f fire hoses, and things like that. That's, those, that wasn't the petty bourgeoisie that was out there. That was the African working class that did that, though they were led by the African petty bourgeoisie. The African, the petty bourgeoisie will always, the petty bourgeoisie will always, the petty bourgeoisie will always betray yes. the revolution yes. <clears throat> as a class, as a social force. <clears throat> but there are elements from the petty bourgeoisie that have the ability to abandon the interests of the petty bourgeoisie, abandon the aspiration of the petty bourgeoisie, and unite with the interests of the African working class and, and, and the aspiration of the working class. And that's not just peculiar even to Africans. We've seen it in the past in other places. And Che Guevara, the doctor who goes to the bush, you know, uh, Mao Zedong, who was a well-off well relatively, comes from a well-off uh, peasant family, you know, becomes a revolutionary, overturned the whole social system. But the, but the class that he represented didn't do that. 
And the class that Che Guevara represented did not do that. Uh, but the, they committed class suicide and united with the aspirations of the working class. That's what we're talking about. So we will see that there are elements uh, from the African population who, according to the economic structure of the society, uh, 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 that's the petty bourgeoisie. Tafari talks about himself, who became a teacher. Now that's a, you know, in, in, in the white society, being a teacher ain't duly squat. But in most of our societies, the teacher is a, you know, kind of elevated place uh, in the world. But what he's saying is that he's glad he discovered African internationalism so that he could, did not fall into the grasp of the petty bourgeoisie. Uh, and, 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 and move in that direction. He committed class suicide. That's what he's saying. You look at people like Emil Carl Cabral is the person who actually defined the concept of, of class suicide. Emil Carl Cabral was, uh, uh, was in, in, in uh, Guinea, uh, Guinea-Bissau uh, and uh, under Portuguese domination. The Portuguese had gone so far as to create a sect of African population that they called assimilados meaning you know, those who have been assimilated, right? And you didn't have to be light-skinned, you didn't have to look like white people, but you had to act like white people. You had to have, know all the history. In fact, the assimilados were better educated than the ordinary Portuguese. The Portuguese, Portugal has for a very long time uh, been a relatively impoverished and relatively backward place. But assimilado, that's different. And so uh, uh, Cabral was educated. Uh, well-educated, I think it was a agronomist, uh, something to that effect, and it was he, you know, who committed class suicide, and he says, you can do this too, but the class will not do that. The petty bourgeoisie as a class won't do it, but the elements from the petty bourgeoisie that can abandon the interests of the petty bourgeoisie and unite with the interests of the working class, and, and that's the best thing to do because the petty bourgeoisie, <clears throat> in fact, has no future. Uh, it's a dying social force any damn way. So, uh, and in fact, you can even see that clearly inside the United States. You know, the petty bourgeoisie as a social force is dying. That's one of the things that's radicalizing the petty bourgeoisie uh, is the fact that it's a dying social force. Uhuru. So, uh, let's, uh, uh, it did, did, do we have Vince Lawrence yet? I just want to see if we can talk about the earlier days. Uh, uh, we do have uh, Comrade Chimaringa, uh, who was talking earlier on about uh, uh, the involvement of uh, the party uh, and Jomo uh, early on. He talked about this whole anti, you know, war, the peace movement, et cetera, that we were all, uh, you know, because the, the party, Jomo even, was the force that really tried to uh, involve the African, you know, so-called uh, liberation movement in the united struggle with the oppressed peoples around the world. So for us, the peace movement and anti-war meant one thing, while it meant another thing for uh, the Socialist Workers Party and the white people who were supposedly leading the peace movement and the anti-war movement. For us, it had to do with uniting the oppressed peoples against imperialism that was killing us all everywhere. And I remember on one occasion, uh, the Socialist Workers Party succeeded. I forgot what it was called. They were involved in this major uh, anti-war action that was all over the country. And in fact, uh, there were people who, from the, um, um, some of the people who were the, uh, involved in the Mexican communities, uh, I forgot that assault they made on the Mexican community, I think in LA. Uh, where they killed a, 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 either a professor or a journalist or something, the, the state did. Uh, it was some kind of ant moratorium, I think, a moratorium on the war. And, uh, uh, and then in, in, in this state, uh, the SWP was organizing this moratorium, mobilization. <clears throat> and and they, raised, they wanted to raise the slogan, like, bring the boys home. That, that was the slogan that they were organizing around. And they had this, this, nas this meeting statewide meeting in Gainesville, Florida. And uh, so we went to the meeting in Gainesville, Florida and uh, uh, with a shotgun and argued, uh, argued rather, Uhuru, please, please mute, comrades, please mute. We can hear you. Who is? Okay, and we argued rather forcefully uh, that, the, that the mobilization should really be in St. Petersburg, Florida, and that uh, it should be around 
political prisoners, African political prisoners, all these uh, people, Africans who were being locked up in prison and after climbing from under the tables and exclaiming that they thought we were being uh, intimidating with the shotgun, they united. And so uh, we had a mobilization here in St. Petersburg, Florida that uh, Africans were central to that mobilization and it was an opportunity that the state tried to use to destroy the entire black liberation movement in the state of Florida, uh, except uh, uh, we were a step or two ahead of them and it didn't work out that way. But I understand that Comrade Vincent uh, Lawrence is on the phone. Comrade Vince, I don't know if you want to say anything about, you know, uh, you were with the Lawrence uh, um, man and the black rights fighters and, and uh, I remember uh, much of our activity together had to do with organizing for African Liberation Day uh, uh, in 1972, uh, but you may have other memories and there's things that you might want to talk about in terms of uh, the early days, the early relationship. Uh, uh, so the floor is yours. This is coming at Vince Lawrence. He's in Fort Myers, Florida. He was a member of the Black Rights Fighter uh, under the leadership of Comrade Lawrence Mann, who was a co-founder of the African People's Socialist Party. Vincent. Are you there, Vincent? And if you are, you're muted. It's going to be a toughie to get Vince Lawrence on, it seems. He was a member of the Black Black Society. And... That's Uhuru, Uhuru, and I, I think that Uhuru, uh, Brother Vincent, how are you? Oh, I'm okay. Yeah, I, 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 I remember doing that. <laughs> if you got a computer working, please, you know, if you're listening to your computer, you should turn it down or off or something because it, we're here. Oh, okay. It. Yeah. All right. All yeah. right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's done. Yeah, I was listening on the, uh, I was listening. Yeah, uh, I remember doing the early days uh, when we first, well, when we first started, was, uh, some girl got, a girl got killed and we, we were suspected with some white folks did it, you know. And so they like, they had a whole bunch of... Where was that at? Oh, that was in Fort Myers, you know, a girl was killed. And then we kind of, a, a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, young people got together and you know, just had a meeting on, on that, and then we organized, you know, organized the uh, Black Rights Fighter from there. And uh, and I remember we went on. I, I'm trying to trying to think when we first met up. I think it was, it was, it was I know we came to St. Pete because we had a, we started a black newspaper and stuff like that. And uh, it was which called uh, Ebony Star. And uh, we, with the Burns Pill already being out there, we came to you know get some. Uh, uh, Expertise on how to, you know, to to, to uh, develop the newspaper, and uh, we, we went on from there. And I, I, met, I think we met with uh, you met with a whole bunch of group of us. Uh, I think with Kobe out of uh, what? Yeah. Kobe, Kobe out of uh, Kobe out of what? Bell, maybe? He was down. They were on yeah. the muck. Kobe was on the muck. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Crowd, yeah. That Kobe was crowd black youth. Yeah. And uh, and Topper and uh. I can't think of where Topper was. Topper was on the East Coast too. All us met together, and uh, uh, and the thing about uh, beat news that we learned uh, learn uh, about theory about what we, what the struggle could be. You know how how to do the struggle and find out what really happened to us besides being uh, 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 just uh, carrying on. You know, just hollering in the air. We know we get we get we got a theory from, and then and uh, 
<laughs> uh, uh, come yeah. at Vincent. Yeah. And can you just say a little bit about Lawrence Mann? Be, you know. Oh, yeah, Lawrence. Lawrence, he was, he, he, was, he was a dynamic person. Uh, you know, me and him always, I, I, I don't even remember how we met. I think we met arguing about something, you know, arguing about this, that, and the other. And we kind of found, found out that our ideas were about the same, you know. And uh, Lawrence, he was, he was a dedicated brother. You know, I, I, I still can't, you know, believe it. Even right now, it's how I believe he's gone. Because yeah. uh, I just remember memory of Yeah. I, I yeah, lost, he, yeah, he was a... Go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead comrade. Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say Lawrence, uh, matter of fact, he was, uh, I reckon, Mike could say he was kind of born organized because we, we was working for Florida Real Legal Services. It would be called Legal Investigator, which, you know, you go out, I reckon, legal agitators, whatever you want to call it. But anyway, uh, in Lawrence came to, matter of fact, he came to, people don't know just how intense that uh, situation was with the migrant workers in southern uh, down in that area of the state <clears throat> because there were some places uh, especially on the muck down in Belglade and what have you where <clears throat> there were actually armed guards that prevented the the, the migrant workers uh, from leaving uh, these camps and what have you. Matter of fact even well, what, round, round neighbors which is supposed to be such a rich place they had a place called Camp Hathaway where they locked you know they had people in there you know we kind of like we was like like I said we was working for Florida Relievers we went in and you know tried to organize the people and stuff you know they'll be shooting killing people and stuff like that you know that, like I said that's about neighbors and the only thing they talk about neighbors got more media than anywhere else but they had more camps than anywhere else I mean yeah. Carney County not neighbors yeah. you say but this Camp Hathaway Yeah, that, that's, that's what helps, uh, you know, to really say something about who the party is and what's part of the party's DNA, uh, because we did organize, you know, uh, in these incredibly, these extraordinarily oppressive uh, circumstances. Uh, <clears throat> I would thank you, Comrade Vincent, uh, uh, and uh, I just want to uh, go uh, to Comrade uh, Kay Fing, who had some experiences also uh, uh, with the party dealing with uh, slave-like situations uh, down there in uh, in uh, southern uh, in northern southern southern Georgia, uh, especially around the the work with Desi Woods, but also you know there are other work that we did too. K. Fing, uh, you you want to intervene now? Yeah, yeah. Uh, all everybody. Uh, I want to just back up a little bit to uh, to come back to Farley's presentation, which I thought, uh, uh, you know, really uh, uh, underscores the, the more than 40 years that the party has put into internationalizing African internationalism. It works. It works. Uh, uh, because we seem like we built... Uh, 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 as Slade would say, you can kill the revolutionary, but you can't uh, uh, can't kill the revolution. Um, uh, and Brother Tafari is an excellent example of that. Uh, I know that uh, um, he said he was born in '93 uh, uh, after you know when Nelson Mandela and ANC was just coming to power. But I do know that that, that our party had opposed had uh, uh, opposed that deal colonial set up. Uh, from the outset, I know that in Oakland, California, or even early on, because we had had a long relationship with the movement, uh, with the revolution and, and, and Occupy the thing. Elizabeth Sabico, remember yeah. Elizabeth Sabico there in Atlanta? 
Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm, I'm telling you, Jim. I know we go playing at our homes. This is in the mid seventies, maybe. But one day, you know, because we were surprised to see a Christmas tree in the house. Yeah, you know? I went but, to but, the, I had a damn Christmas tree in the <laughs> house. <laughs> Yes. But that's another, another story, you know, from the moment, uh, especially after they killed the children in Soweto, yeah. uh, 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 everywhere we were, you know, we would, uh, 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 you know, raise the question of our people in, 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 in occupied uh, Azania. Uh, we had gotten a, a, a film from a comrade sister who was from occupied Azania. Uh, Dolores Thompson, I think her name was, uh, the yeah. last grave at Dom Basel. And uh, everywhere the party was, to the projects in Louisville, Kentucky, to Atlanta, Georgia, down in Florida, we showed this film to, uh, uh, to, 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 to the people in the projects, everywhere. Uh, so, yeah, so we, we, you know, we had a long uh, uh, relationship with that struggle there and when, then when Tutu came to Atlanta, I mean, to, to Oakland to promote the neo-colonial strategy there with the, the Lords of Capital that represented Kaiser Corporation and Clorox, uh, the party refused to let them bring it there. Ran Tutu away. He had to take that program uh, somewhere else. I just want to say that... Um, uh, like Brother Law's man, uh, uh, Brother Vince was saying just then, our uh, uh, once they murdered Law's man, that uh, for most of uh, people from the black rights uh, movement kind of scattered. I won't say that. Uh, that was sort of uh, uh, my personal history, too, being down here in Houston. Uh, uh, where, uh, you well, know, I'm working with People's Party too, but uh, Black Panther Party. Uh, but what they did was they murdered the leadership here of Carl Hampton, which was a part of COINTELPRO, but we did not know at the time. So, uh, like the Vince was saying, people just kind of split. You know, I know I went down to New Orleans, stayed for a minute there, went on up to Atlanta, uh, 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 working with the, you know, petty bourgeoisie, like, uh, well, trying to find, uh, uh, trying to find a way, uh, um, to, to participate in the, in, in, in the movement. Got hooked up with some, uh, 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 you know, black petty bourgeoisie who, who were, you know, more or less intellectual, uh, uh, intellectual type, uh, who had the Africa thing, but, you know, but didn't believe in no parties, you know, that, 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 that the, the black, our people would just, uh, uh, self-organize ourselves and make the revolution as opposed to, uh, 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 building the party was, was, was mute. I had attempted to, uh, to work with the All African People's Revolutionary Party, but at the time, in Atlanta, um, there was big time struggles going on. One struggle was around the, uh, the police and this um, so-called decoy squad they had that had killed about 20 Africans in less than 12 months. And, 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 and the AARP would, would not bug on this question but because they were in, in studying. You know, the same thing with uh, uh, working with the petty bourgeoisie in terms of uh, the, the movement to uh, 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 to put uh, Lady Jackson in as Atlanta's first mayor. You know, uh, it being in the big demonstrations with the, the horses riding to break them up because, uh, even once Lady Jackson had fired, uh, the police he, um, Inman. the police chief refused, Inman. refused to leave. Yeah. Inman, yeah, yeah, John Inman. John Inman refused to leave and surrounded the building with his Ku Klux Klan police. And told Maynard, uh, well, shit, if you want me, I'll come get me. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Maynard at that time abandoned the people and said, well, that's okay, y'all. You stop the demonstration. 
we'll take it to the court. Yeah. So that, that, those are the, uh, 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 the alternatives that, uh, um, that people had. Then, um, uh, I know that in 19, I think 73 or 74, um, demonstrations, African liberation demonstrations, state demonstrations in Washington, D.C., I had, um, uh, Ran across a uh, party member selling the Burning Steel newspaper, I bought one. Um, so, um, you know, and, and, and like what I saw, what I read, you know, looked like I was all. Uh, but nonetheless, went back to Atlanta and um, Kevin O'Malley and, and, and a whole group of people had come to Atlanta to promote the case of. Uh, uh, the cases of Pitts and Lee, two Africans who had been uh, on death row uh, down in Florida for uh, 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 for murder that uh, uh, that they did not commit, um, and soon after that, uh, the case of Desi Woods arose. And Desi Woods was an African woman at killed this white man who had attempted to rape her. And I guess in Georgia she had she had done what, you know, what what was most black revolutionaries wish they could have done at the time. But um uh, uh one of the is that we, we built big organization <clears throat> and I'm kinda of losing my voice, but big organization around the struggle of three days of war was um uh it presented a uh uh a bunch of contradictions, and one, this was at a time when, when, uh, like I was saying earlier, Cortez Pro had, um, uh, had designated most of our organizations, uh, uh, the, the so-called fight left had, 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 had converged on our communities, uh, and, uh, attempted to make everything, uh, in that image, uh, and, and just left us at a, um, uh, uh, uh you know, deep, um, with deep contradictions that, that we did not know how to solve until the party came in and intervened uh, in that process and, um, you know, showed us the way out. And I'm sorry, comrade, but I'm, I'm getting kind of winded now. I'm going to try to talk a little longer. Um, and in this process of organizing, we had to go down in deep, deep, deep south, South, uh, South Georgia, where Klan and other, uh, uh, just regular old white people were, were organized, uh, the state police were blocking roads to where we had to, uh, uh where we had to work. So it, it was, it was a trying and, and, uh, uh, and, you know, perilous kind of times. So, uh, tell me with that, I'm gonna have to let you finish it up, man. That's all right, Comrade so, K-Fing. I appreciate that intervention, <clears throat> and uh, I'm going to move it on, but I really appreciate that intervention because we did a tremendous amount of work there uh, in Georgia. Uh, we went uh, when Desi Woods was placed up. First of all, we had the first demonstration ever in Plains, Georgia, which was the hometown of uh, James Earl Carter, who uh, was the President of the United States at the time, and shook up the tourists and shook up the white people. And we, uh, as a part of that process, uh, came out of uh, 1977 mobilization we had done in Atlanta, Georgia, that brought uh, the first uh, action that pulled uh, the National Liberation Movement together in a national action subsequent to the defeat of the revolution. And we went into uh, Plains, Georgia, shook it up, all these white tourists who came there to uh, to look at the p peanut plantations and what have you, uh, 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 were confronted with uh, angry Africans and Puerto Ricans and white uh, people who were in solidarity. It was, uh, <clears throat> we did that and we went into Hawkinsville, Georgia, uh, uh, where Desi Woods was on trial and they had the highway blocked off and stopping every car uh, that was coming into Hawkinsville. Uh, uh, to intimidate people who were coming in to support her. Uh, there, there was an African preacher who uh, defied them and I think allowed use of his church. Uh, there were, in this place where the white people had their own private jails to lock up Africans, 
uh, it was uh, an extraordinary moment and uh, a threatening moment. And we organized in places that even the old civil rights movement uh, had been fearful of going into. Uh, uh, that's, who, that's who we were, and that's part of, of, of uh, the DNA that uh, is the African People's Socialist Party. And everything we're hearing now uh, is something that is the uh, ideological and historical uh, essence uh, of our party and the membership of our party uh, has the benefit of this, uh, this history uh, these experiences because the truth is that most revolutionary organizations, uh, African organizations, don't live long enough, exist long enough to achieve uh, experience and, and, uh, and, and maturity, revolutionary and political maturity. And the African People's Socialist Party has defied all the odds in that regard. I want to move forward now uh, and see if we can go to Comrade Luizzi. I want to go to Comrade Luizzi. Uh, uh, who is uh, with us uh, from uh, London. Kamel Luizzi uh, was born in Congo, uh, left Congo uh, on the heels of the repression uh, by the Lumumba regime, uh, ended up in France for a, long, for a period of time, uh, and uh, uh, ran into uh, uh, evidence of the party uh, there and then into uh, London where he uh, became an organizer, uh, uh, active organizer, and ran into the party and uh, has worked uh, uh, under the leadership of the party and in, in various areas of Europe and uh, England and, uh, and throughout uh, the African world. So I would like to, for, if Comrade Luizzi can come on and give us uh, some time. Uh, we are uh, deep into the time. I didn't think it was going to we would be going with this length of time since we were not reading from the study, but it's actually, uh, it's all right though. I think it's a much better presentation that we're having than if you know, simply here reading about it. It's Kamel Luizzi, Uhuru. Yes, well, Chairman, I just want first of all just to salute you, uh, your leadership and uh, your work, everything you've done to not just to keep the black revolution alive, but to win every African you could uh, around the planet, basically, to, to join this movement and uh, complete the Black Revolution and unite the African nation is a tremendous, tremendous uh, work. I also, also recognize all the veterans who spoke here, uh, from Gaida to Kefings, and salute also uh, my comrades in South Africa. Uh, this, uh, <clears throat> this is a great uh, uh, study just uh, for many reasons. Uh, I'm uh, someone who was born in the 60s, basically. Uh, I learned about the Black Revolution, the Kuruma, the Lumumba, everything. Just like someone born in the 60s, through the books. You know, when you grew up under Mobutu in the 70s, uh, you know, you just learn uh, that uh, we are independent. So basically, you don't see a revolution anyway. Some of the names you hear there, or person who are, who are dead, Malele and uh, the Womba and the others, uh, something like that. And uh, when you are in Europe, uh, you learn very quickly that socialism is white people, basically. Uh, they are <clears throat> running around the neighborhood, they are everywhere, uh, you know, talking about socialism and uh, uh, things like that. And uh, even though you attract the socialism because it's supposed to be power workers, but uh, you can't really find uh, your place, you know, uh, someone who wants uh, to be free and uh, be in the socialist movement. And, uh, you know, all, everything you, you read before that, uh, the Fanon, you name it, all this kind of uh, material, uh, they, first time they came together, or at least they fell in, in, uh, in, in, into place uh, when I discovered uh, uh, the chairman's book. Reparations now. Uh, that would have been formed in 1990, I think. And uh, subsequent uh, uh, literature of the party, the Madam Spears, and uh, other material. So things just become much clearer. And uh, I know uh, Fanon used to say one of the problems for Africa uh, was the lack of uh, theory. And I knew from the time I just discovered the chairman and the APSP. The theoretical question 
has been solved. This is theory of the black revolution, of the black workers, of the black nation. It was just clear to me that everything just made sense. What did you make sense before uh, when I read Lenin and others now makes sense. And uh, the organizational question, what type of question we need to build uh, for uh, to complete the black revolution. You know, um, and the part of the APSP is a prototype, is the model, is, uh, you know, the, the, the units basically that uh, we need to build. Uh, it is, you know, this becomes as clear, and uh, there are a lot of things basically uh, to say. This is uh, uh, one of them. Uh, so, being being in the, about being the movement, uh, it made socialism, you know, clearly uh, a viable option. It's not a question now having to debate it's a white people think. No, no, no. You know, we know now socialism was a deal. Uh, we know. Uh, Basically, I say after she was built, you know, uh, the itinerary of uh, Engels, uh, Marx, and uh, Lenin, we understand it. You know, we found uh, African people to accumulation. There won't be capitalism. There won't be uh, people thinking about socialism in Europe. So all these things uh, make sense. And that's basically the African people's socialist party. And uh, the place and the role of white people in the struggle, uh, you know, all these questions have been sourced out uh, for us by the chairman, so it became just clear, you know what white people uh, need to do. You know, if uh, you want to be in a revolution, you join the Black Revolution, uh, you join uh, the APHC, you work on the leadership of the party, uh, all these things uh, were made uh, clear. So there is no more for me in my head seeing the white left in Europe having a monopoly for, you know, over uh, revolutionary thought. You know, on the, on the contrary, and uh, that you know that basically was uh, at the end of it. Uh, here, for example, uh, in uh, in, the, in the Europe, because of uh, of the party, uh, at one point we could have all our forces being in motion, organizing in in England, in Belgium, in Germany, uh, in France, uh, in Sweden. Uh, no one has ever done that here. When you have a single organization, you know, uh, around the, you are involved in a single process, uh, you know, so basically you, the, uh, it might not say it openly, but I know the transformation in those places has been really uh, profound. Uh, and uh, in, in London itself, uh, we intervene forcefully. Uh, the question of nationality, you don't hear you will not see a political uh, group here in in, in England uh, who consider them, uh, uh, themselves as being part of the uh, African liberation movement, referring to themselves as West Indians or or, or Black Caribbean or, or things like that. They are, everyone talks of being Africans here, and I have no doubt about it, these are the parties that did it. That definitely the party that did it. Uh, you go to meetings, you hear people saying, "Yeah, this police contentment, our slogan, uh, you know, uh, one Africa, awareness, and that's one, that's all." Even I show up late in demonstration, I do hear people organize, uh, organizing that demonstration, chanting our slogans. Of course, they don't say this come, this, this slogan, these slogans come from the African people, so party, but they do use it. They are T-shirt. With our design, ASI design, mm. you know, but I see people selling it. So we are there. You know, uh, you know, the influence of the party is profound, it's there on the ground. Uh, and now uh, you have a, uh, really have a uh, uh, impact basically of the party. Uh, we launched the strike against Pan Africanism. At, some, at one point, people couldn't say they are Pan-Africanists. They have to say they are nationalist Pan-Africanists, as if that was different, just because they felt that Pan-Africanists was under attack, under assault, being exposed by African internationalism. So the, uh, the impact, basically, uh, of the party uh, is, uh, is profound. Uh, you already heard uh, the you know, testimony coming from uh, uh, comrades at the fire uh, in South Africa where well, today African internationalism is discussed by the workers, ordinary workers. These are people who live in the poor places, people who don't have access uh, to central heating in their homes when it's cold. And you know, in South Africa it's cold. You know, they don't have access to that. They don't have 
access access to your bathrooms, like you know, everyone takes it for granted. If you live in Europe or uh, in North America, uh, but these workers, they discussing black power, they discussing democratic socialism, they discussing opportunism, and they discussing how to remove ANC from power and all opportunism from power. These we really living uh, example of uh, the impact. Uh, of the uh, of the party, uh, Marcus Garvey. You know we have all kind of attacks on Marcus Garvey, all kind of confusion on Marcus Garvey. But today uh, things are becoming more and more clear. The struggle is not over yet. But we are the one. It's the party. It's the chairman leadership that has lost this struggle to not only to carry the legacy of Marcus Garvey, but to remove. Uh, uh, people like Dubois and others as being uh, central figures in a position to Garvey being uh, a marginalized uh, figure uh, in the struggle uh, to unite uh, the uh, African people around the world. So this struggle, as we're talking uh, now, is, is, is being done. It's, you know, wherever we go, we raise the struggle of the significance of Garvey and opportunism of, uh, of Pan-Africanism. So it's an ongoing struggle that we are winning. And this is not something, you know, uh, that is in the past. And uh, that's one uh, beauty I like about African internationalism. It's dynamic. It's not something just talking to you about what happened in the past, but we're defining the reality today and we're showing the way. I'll, take you one, I'll give you one simple example. If you meet uh, someone from Congo, just as an example, I can take any African from anywhere. Uh, one thing that is really mobilizing them today and you will see evidence of it more and more, is the Balkanization of Congo, because imperialism has a, on its agenda the Balkanization of Congo. But because of African internationalism, we see, and most of the Africans from Congo can see, it's not the Balkanization of Congo that you're looking for, or the white part looking for, is the Balkanization of Africa. Somali is part of it, the war in Libya is part of it, uh, the war in Central Africa is part of it. The war in Cameroon is part of it. All the African internationalism can raise those Africans from going elsewhere to the highest consciousness to realize that every balkanization attempt anywhere is the balkanization for African nations, the balkanization for all of us. And it's not separated from gentrification, which is a part, is the same process. You can't have balkanization of Africa not to have gentrification of black communities. They are the same phenomenon. Mm just being manifest in different places, but it's the same thing. Massive displacement of Africans around these wars on being put in concentration camps. Uh, millions, we're talking for million, over 10 million of Africans at any moment are in the concentration camp, death camps. You have all these forced immigration of Africans uh, around the world, they went across the Mediterranean Sea. All these are part of the same process, attack on the African nation. It continues to disperse of African people since the white people attacked Africa uh, in 1415. In the same, uh, in the same process, only African internationalism can raise it, read exactly for what it is, and also call for African international response to it. That's you know that's dynamic. That's using African internationalism not just to explain the past, but to see today and show the way how to solve other problems. So. Uh, these, these are some of the, uh, uh, of the example. And another, another example i like to share is the question of reparation. You go to the Caribbean, the Martinique, wherever you go, there is a reparation uh, uh, organization there. You come to your you go to reparation organization here in London, it's an annual march uh, for reparations. And you can see, we know, this is the influence of the body. And we know it's the influence of the body, not just because you can document it, you look at look for example and stuff, we'll show you that. But you can see the limitations of this movement because they are not the ones who gladly will raise it within the context of making the black revolution, they don't know how to take it further. If you take it further, you will come back where it came from, to the body. And uh, this just shows you just, you know, uh, the uh, the uh, our magnificent uh, how real, uh, how influential, uh, basically that's the role of the vanguard, because that's another question. You always, when you talk about revolution, you ask the question, where is the vanguard? Where is the leadership of it? 
Uh, you name any revolution anywhere in the black uh, community around the world, you won't, you, you will find any. If you do find something, you will find that uh, it's African and it's social interest about it or something's linked to it. And it brings you back to the question for Pranga. You must have a Pranga that's not the passion of the African proletariat. And you will see the ABS piece providing that. And that's the significance of the work being done in South Africa or being done in London or being done elsewhere. Because we have, uh, Chairman basically has a resolve uh, this question. Uh, we need to have uh, our own theory. We need to have our own organization. We need to have our own strategy and tactics. And you can, you can also check this for yourself. Uh, I challenge anybody, you know, to name anyone who has provided clear strategy and tactics to advance the revolutionary process anyway. Uh, since the uh, destruction of the Black Revolution. If someone has done something similar, uh, I'll bet you uh, that that person is no longer in a struggle or that person has not built anything. But when you come to the African People's Socialist Party, you will see everything is united. The theoretical work, organizational work, you know, putting everything into practice are combined, are together, and it's ongoing. It's not something you're taking holiday for two years and five years and disappear, but it's continuous, it's continuous, and you can see that uh, in all uh, aspects. Uh, as I said, there are so much uh, uh, we can say, which will definitely overrun this program. Uh, you can, you know, give examples and share how, share examples of how the party uh, has, has an impact, not, not just on me personally, but on the black community uh, around the world. You will see uh, it is profound. So I will just uh, end by talking about one of the, uh, the uh, slogans, or the first slogans that really caught my imagination, apart from reparation now, is complete the black revolution. Uh, it's quite clear that uh, anyone who talk who want to talk about uh, revolution has to answer a few uh, questions and who is going to lead it and uh, what will be the strategy and the tactics and what will be the role of uh, African people uh, not just in a country where the powers are being contested but around the world and how the rest of uh, you know colonized people and uh, honest the democratic forces around the world who participate. You know, that is, these are no small questions. These are critical questions. And uh, since I read uh, um, uh, on that question, I prefer this very moment. Only answers I have is the answers being developed by the African people. I haven't seen anybody anywhere. Even when you take, you know, struggles, we respect, you know, around the world, you know, from the Middle East or from Latin America and so on, you will see that uh, the uh, call for revolution, uh, the contribution for the revolution to become the main trend in the world again, you will see no organization, no one has made more contribution than the African People's Socialist Party and its leader. And uh, as I say, that office we can talk about, you know, parasitism and lining and, uh, you know, limitations, things like It's a lot. So I just want to. Uhuru, I want to thank Comrade Luese uh, for that intervention. And I just want to point out one really important thing that he mentioned. And he said so much.
That's the fundamental question, and the movement has, has to facilitate revolution. What I'd like to do now is go to Comrade Penny Hess, uh, who is the chairwoman of the African People Solidarity Committee. And uh, uh, I've known this comrade since uh, the 1970s. I don't want to give a sp specific date to it because I know it was in, uh, I think, September uh, 1976 <clears throat> that we organized the African People's Solidarity Committee, but I <clears throat> certainly knew her certainly a, at least a few weeks before then. Uh, so come at Penny. Me, and I really appreciate this, this discussion today, which shows the party, just the depth of the living. Um, Who? What are you saying? Can't hear Penny? Is it because of where this is located? We can't fix that K thing. Yeah, I wasn't <laughs> able to hear a lot of them, either, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but I can tell that it was really good. <laughs> I wasn't able to hear a lot of what people said. Well, you were. No, I wasn't. But I could tell that it was really good, though. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah I, I don't know. know. Hopefully speaking online it was speaking. better. I don't know. But um, anyway, that's just because of here. But I just really wanted to salute all, the, all of the um, party leaders and the speakers before me and how it shows that the African People's Socialist Party is a dynamic, living organism and about what everybody talked about. There's so much to be said. I just wanted to say a couple of things. One, that the African People's Socialist Party formed the African People's Solidarity Committee in 1976 as an organization of white people to extend the African Revolution into the belly of the white population and to bring African internationalism and the organization of the party there. And that has been a very successful and, and incredibly important strategy of the party. So the party came to the San Francisco Bay Area around 1978. It did so as part of, originally I think as part of the, the struggle to free Desi Woods that has been talked about. And that um, I just wanted to, to say, first of all, that the profound uh, impact of the struggle to free Desi Woods and the party's leadership is something that needs to be summed up because the party took on struggle with all opportunist forces around that by, first of all, challenging the white left, the white women's movement, and the white LGBT movement by defining that struggle of an African woman killing a white man who tried to rape her and her friend as um, a struggle against colonial violence as opposed to a str uh, the right of a woman in general to defend herself. And that was really, really critical and the party built a huge, huge committee to free Desi Woods. And you talked about the, the um, demonstration in Plains, Georgia, which was in, on July 4th, 1978. I just also want to say that there was, on the same day, an enormous mass demonstration in San Francisco going through the streets of San Francisco for to free Desi Woods as well, led by led by the party and led by that committee. So it was a huge movement. And I was living in New York when um, the demonstrations for planes happened in in July on July 4th, 1978. And the party had a bus that went from New York City to planes. And we went down on the bus. <clears throat> and on that bus were forces from the African movement and African people and Puerto Rican and from the Puerto Rican independence movement and other white people. There was, you know, a mixture of people who were on that bus. And the Africans and the Puerto Ricans were from the South Bronx or East Harlem, which was known throughout the world as being the worst conditions that colonial conditions that African people can live on, live under. And we went through, because Plains, Georgia is this little tiny town where Jimmy Carter was from, 
<clears throat> and um, it was way out in the country. And so it wasn't like you went on the highway and got off. We went through all these country roads to get there for miles and miles and miles. And the conditions of Africans that you could see, like living in sharecropper huts with no electricity and just, you know, just conditions that you would have thought would have been a hundred years before that, where it was just so glaring. And so in planes, when the bus got into planes, um, all of the international media was there because it was partly because it was the home of Jimmy Carter. So it was a really great media opportunity. And so these African people and Puerto Rican people started getting off the bus and all the media and their cameras come rushing up to them. And it was really powerful to hear all these different people talking to different media. Again, Africans and Puerto Ricans from New York saying, we are outraged in President Carter's state. The conditions of African people are the worst that we have ever seen. And we're from the South Bronx, and we know what that means. You know, So it was just a brilliant strategy and the impact of that. And to have see you know, walking down the, the square a town square in Plains, Georgia, to see all these white people crying <laughs> and stuff, looking, you know, from there and seeing the uprising of African people it was really, really powerful. But in this period, the party went to the Bay Area to build the movement to free Dusty Woods, and there was the possibilities of working with white people who were really. Um, who seemed really open, who said that they supported the struggle against for national liberation of African people. And while the party was there in those years, in 78 and 79 in San Francisco, which is where it was first, um, the movement for the liberation of Nicaragua, the struggle, the revolution was going on in Nicaragua, and the Sandinistas had sent um, some organizers to San Francisco because there was a large um, exile population of, of Nicaraguan people there. So there were actual Sandinistas who were assigned to be there and the party instantly made very close, a close working relationship with the Sandinistas, which is why the chairman was later invited there officially after the revolution won. Um, and that was, you know, that was a really, really important. And I feel like in a lot of ways, the Sandinistas looked to you for leadership in so many ways and could really express the importance. If white people wanted to support the struggle in Nicaragua, they would say, because they would speak at every event, they would say the best thing that you can do is work under the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party inside this country. And they really, really, you know, grasped the significance of the African Revolution inside the borders of the US. But one thing that Sandinistas always talked about was this mountain in the rainforest or jungle of Nicaragua where they trained and where the army, um, the Sandinista Liberation Army, um, trained up in the mountains and was their rear base. It was their rear base where they could sum up and where they had their bases. And so the chairman always said, well, we don't have a mountain. African people don't have a mountain, but we do have San Francisco. <laughs> That's the mountain. And that the reason that you said that was because that there were white people, there were the ability to resources that the party had never had before. There was a kind of liberalism in the Bay Area. And there was the weather. You could be out fundraising out, out almost 365 days a year in that climate. And it was just a whole different thing. It had this liberal kind of thing that let us raise money on the streets or be in front of stores or all kinds of street fairs and things that we plugged into. So, you know, that was the mountain because it, it was saying that the solidarity movement is the rear base of the party. Um, and, while, and then the Prairie Fire Organizing Committee who was, that was really an opportunistic white left, you know, just horrible organization um, that had been interventionist into the struggle of African people out there, out in California, the party came in and immediately challenged that. And then 
um, Prairie Fire connected African forces made like an armed assault in a way, an attack and a threat on the party. So the party had to make a, a brief strategic retreat back to the East Coast. Um, but when the party returned to the Bay Area, the party returned and, o and APSC went to Oakland. And Oakland, so it left San Francisco to the white left and to all that, you know, and went to the heart, what was back then, an African city, which only 10 years before that had been the center of world revolution where the Black Panther Party was. And the party, you would always say, Chairman, that you can still smell the cordite in the air because it was like the African people were stunned. Um, they were demoralized because the, the movement had been so brutally crushed in such a quick period of time. And that, you know, I just think it was so significant that we need whole books to understand the significance of the Oakland years, what we call the Oakland years, the 1980s in particular into the early 90s and the struggle that the party made that was really dual power. First of all, it was really dual power because nobody, nobody could do anything in Oakland that would ever attack the African working class without paying a price. And that meant politicians, that meant the white left, that meant the church, um, it meant everything. Um, and the party was out there, we lived on the street we lived on the street. We were out on the street every single day organizing for Measure O, um, the housing initiative, um, until midnight often, not uh, getting signatures. We had our meetings at 1 a.m. sometimes because we had to be out there till midnight to get 30,000 signatures. And, you know, I mean, it was just an incredible time and that the party predicted or knew that that the US government was putting crack cocaine into the African community and summed that up. And that's why um, Gary Webb and other kinds of things, you know, people who, ex white people who exposed the crack understood that because the party was demonstrating that the White House is the crack house and Uncle Sam is pusher man. And that the party's goal was to complete the black revolution of the 60s and keep alive that and was the only force out there doing anything like that. Everything else was neo-colonialism and the unity of the white left with that. Um, Kay Fing, I think, mentioned when Oakland was, well, first of all, the party's, um, the party's, you know, just boldness in, in denouncing the fact that Mandela was going to be free and going to be the, the independent president of South Africa. The party denounced it, had events, and was really uh, attacked by the KPFA and the white left at that time. And then the city of Oakland was going to have this huge banquet when Desmond Tutu was going to come to Oakland. And the party and Kay Fing played a really big role in this, organized to stop that, to Desmond Tutu was not going to come. And all, and that, that was so powerful that the entire African petty bourgeoisie found a reason not to support it, not to support it. And I remember that Kay Fing, we were on the steps of this big auditorium that night that had all the tables, you could see through the glass that all the those tables were out there. Yeah, well, I was going to say, you can, see the, you can see the tables, you can see these waiters looking out the window. And Kay Fing was leading a demonstration on the steps. We can see that. Not one person came. Not one person came. And I think Desmond Tutu ultimately, well, he wasn't there either. So, you know, it was, the party had dual and contending power. And yeah, we wrote to to told him it would be a good idea for him not to show up. Yeah. Right, and he didn't. And so then, you know, just the power that the party had um, around when Huey Newton was killed, the party was the um, what would you say the uh, the guard, the color guard, honor, or what, yeah, the, the honor, honor guard yeah. at the at the um, uh, what do you call the funeral home yeah. where ten thousand people came. Yeah. 
the party was all dressed yeah. in their yeah. berets and their outfit, their uniform, then at the funeral home and then played a, the role, we the printed, defining role. We printed role. the program. We printed the yes. funeral program. Yeah. And played a, at the funeral, yeah. played a defining role. And after the funeral, when Biko Lumumba was outside, because there were tens of thousands <laughs> of Africans outside, and Biko was on top of a van, organizing with huge banners, and led a march behind the hearse, yes. you know, as it proceeded down the street. I mean, just to, to say the power, the dual and contending power of the party. And just finally, I wanted to say, there's so much more to talk about, but that the African People's Solidarity Committee was formed in 1976, but APSC was developed by the party in the heat of struggle in Oakland. And it's really critical. It's really critical because the party was taking on struggles on one front against all this opp opportunist white left that raised its head in the face of the counterinsurgency against the Black Panther and the Black Revolution, and, um, and at the same time was working and struggling with APSC within its ranks to understand and to, um, and to embrace African internationalism, which ultimately was successful, but it did take, <laughs> it took a number of years. Um, but it was able to win the question of reparations, and we were one in the 80s to the question of reparations and how, you know, that we understood, because the party had summed up, that this was a period of counterinsurgency, so that we couldn't win $30,000 for one speech, which was what happened to the Panthers a lot of times. They would make, you know, somebody would make a speech and just the people would send in all these envelopes of money and it would be like $30,000, you know. That wasn't going to happen right now because the party was defending that. So we, you know, started going to the flea market, selling cookies, doing all of these things that this was the division of labor that the party gave us as the party worked under, you know, worked in organizing the African working class. So this, I think that the whole strategy of the party has, was very, very um, important in building APSC and winning international forces. Also, the party made the contact with Union de Barrio in this period and has had that ever since. So the party had a strategy to um, break the isolation of the African working class and the African Revolution and the, you know, the formation of APSC and its international relationships were things that really helped the party survive the counterinsurgency and were really critical to it in this period when it was in the thick of the heart of the counterinsurgency against the African working class. So it was a powerful, powerful period. Oh, hold on. Um, uh, Comrade Director Akile, uh, <clears throat> I would like, uh, we're going to run a little over. So I want to do that uh, because I want, uh, first of all, I want uh, Comrade Bakri to have something to say. I want Comrade Gaida to have something to say. And then I would like uh, for the people to be able um, to participate in this discussion as well. So we, we may be we may be as much as a half hour over what we were scheduled to do. So, uh, Comrade Bakri, are you there? Oh, Comrade Bakri, how are you doing? I'm doing well, Chairman. Splendid. It's good to hear you. Um, I'd like to have your contribution. You've heard what's been said up to now, and uh, <coughs> I want to know if, if there's something that you'd like to contribute to this discussion in terms of the work and development of the party, your participation. Again, what we're trying to expose is the living history of the African People's Socialist Party, and I think that's really important. You can read it uh, as it's written down, but you don't get the, really get to understand it in the same way uh, as if we are hearing people who experienced it, participated in it, and you know, give a good sense of everything that was going on, even with, with themselves. So uh, go ahead, Comrade Bakri. Hello, Chairman. I really appreciate uh, being a part of this uh, process. I appreciate uh, your leadership, and I salute that, and as well as everyone else on this call. Um, just listening to everyone's 
speak before me, I experienced a lot of what has been said, and there were some things that preceded me. And it made me think about Oakland. Um, I grew up mainly in Oakland. I'm from South, but I grew up in Oakland. And I remember the Panther years in Oakland, and I, um, you know, witnessed the counterinsurgency in Oakland as well. I'm not understanding it back then, but I do know my first introduction to the party and when I first, first became in contact with the party, it reminded me of uh, what uh, a revolutionary period was here in Oakland. And the African People's Socialist Party was the only thing that resembled a revolutionary organization subsequent to the defeat of the Panthers, from my view. And um, I remember my first contact came off Fort Dirt here in Oakland, um, seeing spray-painted party slogans. Um, you know, representing the working class struggle was the thing that drew me in. Because prior to that, I worked with study groups from the All African People's Revolutionary Party. I had uh, went to uh, African churches like Jose Church in Oakland, uh, never to really feel fulfilled in terms of understanding the contradictions that were here in front of me every day. It was the African People's Socialist Party that answered a lot of those questions uh, theoretically and practically to what was referring to as the dual and contingent power institutions. And it was greatly appreciated. And I remember my um, first meeting I came to at the Hoover House. I came on Sports Earth. I got out of my car and I wrote down the Hoover House off of a um, poster that was um, put up on the wall about uh, Freddie Lee Robinson. A uh, young African who was um, um, thrown in jail for supposedly murdering an Oakland police officer who he did not. And it was the party that took on that campaign. And that's what drew me actually to the Hoover House in my first meeting. And um, I was a nurse at the time. And uh, the party was building a dual and contending power institution called the Bobby Hutton African People's Freedom Clinic that Comrade Gaida was a. Uh, leading at that time, and I, I joined work off of that, and I remember going into the projects in East and West Oakland, uh, providing health care to African people, and not only providing health care, but organizing them around the question of health care, um, and a lot of people uh, were participated in work with the Panthers um, also, and, and recognized the party as an organization um, that was working within the African working class, like it in the project. So I really appreciated um, hearing comrades uh, talk about the work uh, around the world, because all of it is about the African uh, liberation. My first demonstration was what Kate Bing and Penny were referring to with the Desmond Tutu um, thing that happened at the Oakland Auditorium. That was my very first demonstration there, and I recall that. Vividly, um, at the Oakland Convention Center, which is literally around the corner from where I live now, and it's a big dinosaur in the community, not even used anymore. Um, but I think about Oakland, I think about, you know, Huey that was mentioned. Um, Huey Newton, um, again, was the leader of the Revolutionary Party here in Oakland in the 60s. And Huey endured a lot of things, and it was the party that rescued Huey in a certain kind of way where we brought Huey back in a political life um, at the Uhura House in Oakland um, in the late 80s. And Huey came out to speak and Huey made statements like, you don't have the Black Panther newspaper, but you have the Burning Spear. Uh, you don't have uh, the Black Panther Party, but you have the Uhura movement. And Huey himself said that. Uh, which was like a passing of the torch from one revolutionary period to the other. And um, it was a little bit after that when we know that Huey was murdered and um, that the party intervened and held up, up the revolutionary process where we did massive demonstrations that was led, but thousands of people were in the streets and it was led by the African People's Socialist Party. Uh, we printed the program for the funeral itself we were the honor guards at the viewing, at the funeral homes. Um, and even today, as I do this work in Oakland, California, people still come up to us right now today 
asking us about the dual and contending power institutions that we built in Oakland. Uh, people still in 2018 asked us about the Uhuru Bakery uh, that was built and that was um, uh, um, burnt down back in uh, the late 80s. Um, people still ask about is the Uhuru House there. You know, I remember when I used to come and see this artist or come see different forces who came through Oakland um, in their early years before they blew up and became these uh, culture workers uh, like Digital Underground and other people. Um, the work that the party did in the Oakland years is so much to um, talk about, but a lot of it has been touched on, including the beginning of the International People's Democratic Aurora Movement was called PDOM, the People's Democratic Aurora Movement that came off work around the counterinsurgency before it became the National People's Democratic Aurora Movement to become what we know today as the International People's Democratic Aurora Movement. Um, I know they talked about Measure O. Um, I wasn't around in Measure O, but I came around and I was here with Measure H, which was a similar uh, land reform um, uh, proposition that we had put on the ballot and won a lot of votes. Um, and the thing that I appreciate about this party, it, is, it does real work in the organization. Penny talked about um, being up having midnight meetings and 1 a.m. meetings and summing up work. Um, That's the kind of work that has been done in Oakland. Um, and I appreciate that in a thousand different ways because when we go and do other work with other organizations, you have to appreciate um, the plan of action, the, the discipline, the organization, it really helps you to appreciate what the party does in a thousand ways. And um, I just wanted to say one other thing. I came across this book called The Van, it's a pamphlet, um, probably written back in the late 80s, called The Vanguard Party and the Road to Black Power. Um, now, that book is a little pamphlet. It sums up some of the things that we talked about with the um, the Bobby Hutton Freedom Clinic and some other work that was going on in Oakland, but it just helps me to appreciate the party. A lot of things we're talking about today uh, were put forth uh, a long time ago. As the chairman said, it's in the party's DNA. And Oakland, um, I love Oakland a lot, and I love Oakland even more because it is the place where the African People's Socialist Party revived the revolution and brought the revolution back to the masses of people. Um, and as a party was recognized then, the party will be recognized again as we do this work. Uhuru. Uhuru. Thank you, Comrade Bakri. I want to now move to, to uh, Comrade Gaida. Comrade Gaida is currently in Atlanta. Um, and uh, as was mentioned, uh, Comrade Gaida has uh, been in the party since 81, 1981. Uh, she has been involved in struggles uh, almost everywhere in Europe, uh, West Africa, uh, throughout the United States, uh, a political prisoner uh, in Tampa, Florida, uh, just uh, an incredible history uh, with the African People's Socialist Party. Uh, Kamen Gaida. Uhuru Chairman and Uhuru, you know, to all the comrades um, who spoke before me, I. First of all, I want to say that, um, you know, I really thank the chairman for his, you know, his great insight um, in terms of the African struggle, African, African liberation movement and his perseverance, you know, that he held the party together for us to find the party because the party defined my life, who I am. I can't separate the party from, the, you know, from who I am. And this is a tremendous party. I don't think we give it... Um, I think that the history that we're talking about, you know, is so vast because as comrades spoke, I thought about all the areas that were left out and it's just too much to do in one hour. And I'm hoping that we would organize another session because I think it's so important that the people that are coming into the work right now understand where they came, you know, where this party that they joined came from, you know, who this party is, so that they can understand what their responsibility and role is, you know, in terms of completing the back, Black Revolution of the 60s. I remember always in my mind hearing the chairman talk about, the, you know, um, the revolution in the 60s was a, just a dress rehearsal for what is to happen, what is to come. And I think that 
comrades coming in now uh, have a great responsibility to write and divine that uh, era of the work, this period, you know, as we go forward. I um, it came into the party, like the chairman said, in 1981, in December of 1981. And, um, and this was after, first of all, I came from a, a country in Latin America, um, the, you know, Panama. And um, Panama was just like in Africa. It was a place that where the black community lived was so poor. Um, and I never could understand the poverty, you know, because my mother, you know, worked, you know, for, you know, white people. And it wasn't just working. She would go to work and stay for a month before she would come home, maybe for a weekend. And we called it living in. And then my father also was a laborer through the canal, the Panama Canal, uh, you know, which was one of the one of the only resources, you know, for the Panamanian government that was controlled by America. And so, you know, we grew up in the area that was supposed to be the area to protect, you know, um, the canal, which was then uh, uh, American territory. And uh, living in that area, we, what we had, you know, in terms of even information from the outside world was armed forces. That's, that's the radio that we had that we listened to. And needless to say what that was all about. But I remember my father, my grandfather being a guardian. You know, I remember as a little girl, you know, jumping rope and would see my grandfather sitting in the park with all these men around him. And he was kind of a teacher. He would be the one that read the newspaper and the, and decipher it for all these men, you know, and I could remember him talking about Garvey and the Yankees, you know, that's what he called the Americans then, and it, it stuck with me, you know, and there were so many questions, and in Panama, um, when you graduated from high school, everybody dreaded graduation, because when you graduated, there was nothing for you to do, there was, it was almost like your life was ended then, first of all, you had to move out of the American sector, even if your family lived there, you had to be on your own now. You have become, you know, an adult. You didn't know where you were going because there was no place to live in, in, on the Panamanian sector. So it was a time of doom, you know. And I always wanted to come to the United States because I think, you know, I heard that it was a land of milk and honey and that you will make it when you get there. And that was your salvation. And so when my mother got an offer to come to work with white people, I convinced her to give me, let me go instead. And... She didn't want to. She was very reluctant because we never left home. We never even stayed out a night from our home. And so she was reluctant to send me, but I nagged her so much that she sent me. And when I came, it was the worst experience in my entire life. I was like 18 years old. And I came to this place, and I went straight into these people's houses. It was a three-story house, and I became everything from the, from the cook to the child care provided to the laundry, to the, and I, it was like slavery. And I began to understand what it meant for African people to live under slavery. This was, you know, I saw nobody, I knew nobody, and it was just terrifying for me until I was able to escape, and I literally escaped in the middle of the night, not knowing where I was going, but just knew that I had to get out of there. And I was always searching, so, you know, I ended up going to universities and still wasn't pleased didn't understand what my life is about, didn't understand, you know, the, the questions that I have in terms of what is to become of African people. And I went to, you know, one university after the other, you know, um, you know, my associate years, my bachelor years, until I ended up in Columbia University, being tracked there, you know, because at that time they were looking for Africans to be in that university so that they could disclaimed the whole thing of being racist. You know, it was one of the prestigious universities, and that's where I met the Burning Spear newspaper. And I saw the spear, the comrade there was selling the spear, and I became excited when I looked at the spear and began to read the stuff. And for the first time in my life, I rem you know, I remember the feeling that I had to get out of the university. You know, I had to get away from this place, and I had to find this organization. And um, I found the... This, you know, I, I found more about the spear by joining the, the uh, what was then a mass organization uh, led by a preacher. That was my first encounter with, you know, politics as, on a whole, like black politics. And I was part of the, um, 
security section because it was run by this preacher and uh you know yeah they had a whole security section and they posture as a revolutionary organization and so you know join the security section learn how to do martial arts and all of that stuff in terms of protecting the organization but it was then since then it was then and and i think continues to be a neo-colonialist organization and it wasn't until you know we had a conference that um you know there's yeah, we re- realized that we needed to have the Burning Spear as one of the teaching tools in the organization, and the organization denied us the ability to use the Burning Spear as a tool, saying that it was always, when organizations were overturned, it was always overturned from the military part of it, and we were seen as the military part of the organization. So we began to struggle that we read, the, you know, that we had the Burning Spear for, as a teaching tool. And once they denied us that, we went off on our own and had secret studies of the Bernie Spear. And in the training um, that we were doing, they, you know, um, they asked us to invite a personality to, um, you know, to speak, at, you know, in terms of organizing us as organizers, that we invite this personality. But the person that asked us to do that, when we said that we wanted to invite Chairman O'Malley as teller from the African People's Socialist Party, he said, well, uh, you don't have to do any organizing. You really don't have to put out any leaves. That you really don't have to do anything because this man is not all that he's made out to be, uh, you know. And so we brought chairman to speak to us. And I remember being in the, uh, in the area, in the auditorium where he was speaking, where he was supposed to speak, and wondering, where is this person? And we were like, this person is late. Where is he? We did no organizing work. And as we were making that you know, announcement in terms of we're waiting for the the speaker, the chairman said, I'm here. And it stayed with me in my mind because he was so humble. The chairman was so humble that this man was, and we had learned that everybody in, in, you know, the Black United Front, that's the organization where we were, was supposed to be revered. You know, you, you, you kissed the ring for all of these leaders. And then here was this man that was so, you know, humble. And I remember when the chairman got up and spoke, something went off in my head that, oh my God, we have to organize this man, this message that this man is bringing, we have to organize. So we ran out on the sidewalk and tried to get people to come in, please come in and listen to this, you know. We were so excited, you know, by the politics of the African internationalism that the chairman was putting out. So this was my first encounter with the party. And then we later on, we had another encounter where the Black United Front, uh, took us someplace and had the Nation of Islam confronted us as a security section and they fought, we physically fought with them because we were fighting for a place as a security uh, organization of the Black United Front and the nation wanted to, you know, be that, you know, they wanted to take over, they wanted to search the women they, and we refused to make that happen and so, you know, we fought. We had a physical encounter with them and the uh, the Black United Front brought us in and had a tribunal and rebuked us for fighting with the nation. And at that point, we wrote to the chairman and said that we, you know, this tribunal happened and that the Black United Front, you know, had cast us out. And we, the whole security section left with us and we built the African People's Socialist Party then. And that is, you know, that is how, you know, we became the African People's Socialist Party in New York City. But there's so much, you know, in terms of the Oakland years and, you know, all of the, you know, the work, the work that we're not able to talk about in, in this uh, session, you know, all of the stuff that happened even in the Tampa Bay area, you know, the Tampa Bay rebellions that the party, you know, participated in, you know, um, the tribunal, we needed to dissect the tribunal so that people would understand the, the magnitude of putting the United States government on trial. We were the first organization. This was the first time that any organization had, you know, uh, put the United States government on trial for the crime of trial for the crime of genocide, you know, uh, you know, um, of, you know, genocide among, among African people, for, you know, against African people. And what it took to organize that tribunal and how we created our own court that we decided that since they will not, you know, under, you know, hear us at the United Nations, the United States blocked that, we had no ability to go to the Hague you know, that we will use international law and we will create our own tribunal and our own uh, court and that we would 
taken as seriously as any court. And as long as we ratified it, it was, uh, in fact, a legitimate court. And we, the chairman acted as the, uh, the people's advocate that would present the, the, the case of the people. And we had judges. We had uh, judges from the indigenous people. We had a judge coming from Barbados. We had a judge coming from Senegal via Paris. And uh, we were, he, the judges would listen to all of the evidence. And we had three, two days of continuous testimonies. You know, people coming from all around the country. So glad to see that finally the government, the United States government was put on trial for the crimes against African people. We had testimonies, you know, that ran. We didn't have enough time to have all of the testimonies that we had. We, this is where Leonard Jeffrey, Professor Leonard Jeffrey, those of you who know about him, this is where he got recognized because he presented uh, around the sociological impact, you know, of, of, um, of uh, uh, stage slavery on the African community. What was the outcome of that? You know, we had a psychological impact. We had people talking about how it affects us health-wise. And nurses from Harlem, you know, we had Mufundi Lake talking about the prison system and how Africans were faring in the prison system, how we were wallowing in, 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 a, in abuse and all kinds of things. So there were so many profound statements that were made at the tribunal. And at the end of the tribunal, the judges came back with a verdict that the United States government was guilty of, of, of genocide. We used covenants, you know, and, and, you know, that were, that were ratified by countries to say how, uh, you know, how people should be treated by the government, you know, and, you know, we just really had a magnificent uh, uh, tribunal, and this was, just happened in New York, you know, and, uh, you know, like I said, the verdict was guilty, and that the, you know, that the United States government owed African people in the U.S. $4.1 trillion, and that was just referring in 1982 dollars, and that was just referring to the question of um, slavery, and not to even take on subsequent to slavery, all that we suffered up to today. So, you know, that was the impetus, and then of this whole reparation thing, and then when we went into, at the third day, on the 15th, we built the African National Reparations Organization. We had to justify the tribunal, our case, by having a tribunal, and that was the chairman's strategy, and we said that reparation had to be organized to become a household word for all the Africans because we recognize that African, the African masses had to participate in reparation for it to be truly reparation. But, you know, um, they had to define what reparation would be and that we couldn't leave it up to the government to de define what reparation would be for us because they had the ability to, to get a few petty, African petty bourgeoisie organizations, give them some money, and then call it reparations. And so everything that you saw in terms of subsequent to that, you know, um, what came off of the, you know, of the work of the African People's Socialist Party. For 12 consistent years, we had reparations all around the country in different places so that we could bring the whole uh, question of reparations to the African community, you know, to help it, you know, have the community organize and unite around the question and to make it like a household word. So we were effective in that, you know, that everything that you heard about reparations subsequent was on the backs of the tribunal that we did. Um, you know, so those are the yeah. I want to thank you, Comrade. And I'm going to ask uh, Comrade Akile to really look at, you know, doing something like that uh, Comrade Gaida said, that we need to be able to have an extensive uh, discussion so that this history, you know, you know, becomes the custody of our whole movement. I think that it's, it's um, you know, important to uh, consolidate in unity and and what have you of the organization. And uh, some people are confused because they think history began uh, with their, <laughs> their emergence. They got some consciousness and suddenly history has begun. But everything rests upon the foundation. There's a foundation of struggle and resistance that's been going on for a while now. And the party, uh, some people have asked a question, you know, like uh, I remember this one person who used to be a pretty close comrade, he would always say, to me that how the party always attracted young cadre. So what young cadre? And the people who you've heard speaking up to now haven't all been that young. Uh, but the thing is, the theory is, the theory is a living dynamic theory. And, and everybody, young people, old people, et cetera, can see the future in this process. And so that's the thing that attracted young people because they could see the future. We'd go to some 
organizational meetings. People are celebrating the 50th this or the 30th this of the 40 years of existence, and it's like a geriatric uh, nursing home, you know, center or something like that. That was all that was there. Uh, but the party uh, is a young organization because uh, African nationalism is a dynamic, you know, continuously developing theory, and what contributes to the development of the theory is the participation of the people. The people can see the future in it. That's why young people have come to it and have not gone to those uh, geriatric uh, circles. So what I would like to do is uh, open it up, and then let's see if, if, if people who are online uh, might want to raise uh, anything first, and uh, obviously people who are here in, this, in the room where we are in St. Petersburg. Penny, I see you. Yeah. <laughs> Comrade Penny says that dialectics teaches us that there was the time when young, when older people were young. <laughs> and in fact, in fact, uh, the cessation of aging, right, when is the point of death, right? Yeah. So. You heard that, uh, uh, I hope you heard that, Comrade Omawale. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, I heard you. You heard I heard it. And, and I, would, I, would, uh, uh, I, would, I would hope that, that Comrade had a uh, follow up on Gaida's uh, uh, concern because I know that there's so much more <clears throat> yeah. that I could have contributed to this discussion. Yeah. So was not able to do it because I tried it all at, at once. I noticed, you know, we, we didn't even talk about the poverty of the party where, you know, yeah. where, um, you know, we didn't even have a vehicle at one point. Yeah. At the Hitchhiker Lab, uh, yeah. um, to Alabama to pick up a car, go to jail in the process of doing it, this man chairman. Yeah. Get there, get the car. The car don't even make it out of Alabama before it breaks down. I mean, poverty, yeah. no food, no money. You know, but we struggle, uh, uh, struggle through all of this. We didn't mention the fact that there was a party who came into Philadelphia and rescued the whole African community there after uh, the black mayor, who the whole black community had supported, dropped the bomb. Uh, uh, on the move organization. Yeah. That's so, so much more. Yeah. That, that, uh, that we need to talk about here. We rescued the Black Liberation Movement with the 1977 um, uh, march in Atlanta, Georgia, where the working class itself, the party, brought them together to organize a committee that would end up being international. And it had, as a, uh, 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 you know, as I said, um, this is just so much we can contribute to. Or the fact that, uh, Chevron, we went to San Francisco and met with the people out of the People's Temple before they went back over to get Jonestown, Guyana, yeah. to get to, 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 to get murdered. Yeah. And how we had to find them. So yeah. There's just so much, so much, uh, uh, so much more that I think I can contribute. And if we do this in another kind of format, I will be able to do that. But I kid you, hope you're listening, and I hope you make that happen. Uh -huh. As I think a package, we can even up and we do it. Send it out. Yeah, I well, think it's important. I mean, we've been looking for formulas to have in this discussion for a while now. We've even tried to talk about how to make it happen during the Congress and, you know, but right now we've been two hours, and two hours is a long period, like in the Congress, but we can make this happen. I think we have to make this happen uh, because this is critical history and I think it's uh, part of the process of uniting and bonding the party and the Uhuru movement uh, so that everybody can understand the significance because everything that we're doing today has its origin, has its beginning, has a it, it stands on a particular foundation of struggle. I mean people are continually uh, uh, discovering stuff that the party has been dealing with now for, you know, 40 years or so, you know, uh, and solutions. We, they're, they're discovering contradictions that we've resolved, you know, 40 years ago. And I just think it's really important for us to be able to do that. So do we have anything that from people who are 
online and uh Uhuru. um <clears throat> well we have two uh comments but there's actually a lot of right. engagement um one's from uh comrade aisha who is the director of the all african people's development and empowerment project um, this is a comment um, in Hunter, Alabama, says, what an absolutely dynamic and critical discussion on the history of the party. It must be clear to any politically honest force that Chairman Amalia Shetela is the leader of the entire African nation and that the APSP is the advanced attachment of the African working class and the undisputed vanguard of the African revolution. And then we have comrade Malika Alexander, who I believe is in St. Louis. Um, she says, Ahuru Chairman, I salute you and your committed stance in the struggle for the liberation of African people. It is through this type of political education that we do indeed present ourselves to the world as the best sons and daughters of Africa. We are winning. And um, this is a question from Comrade Olafini Kemba, who is in Hawaii. Um, Uhuru Chairman, how did the party develop the brilliant analysis that our struggle is not against racism, but, um, but rather colonialism? Uhuru. Uhuru. That's a, that's a really interesting question. Um, and I don't know exactly how to answer that, except to say that I've always been uncomfortable with the character, always, all my life, ever since I've been conscious of the term, the word racism, since I can first remember hearing the concept of racism, uh, because it just seemed to me, even from the beginning, that it didn't say anything. It, it made the contradiction an idea. You know, it made, this is the contradiction, this, this term called racism that didn't, didn't say anything, didn't explain something. So I've always been uncomfortable with that. And uh, the more I learned uh, about how uh, history unfolded and how politics manifests itself in the real world, this is practical, uh, concretely, how politics represents itself in the real world, it, it's, obvious that colonialism, that's the thing that's been described by everybody in the world is in fact this thing called colonialism. And I was, it was clear to me uh, early on uh, that, that when we were struggling inside the United States and other places that we were struggling against the same kinds of thing that the Vietnamese were fighting against, that people in Palestine, they were fighting against. In fact, we learned from each other, the Vietnamese, the Palestinians, and the African Liberation Movement here and other places, we learned from each other. So early on, I understood that. And uh, for a while, uh, uh, because uh, what you find is that until the class has its own uh, developed uh, kind of uh, uh, ideology, we will borrow uh, uh, from, you know, like other classes, dominant classes. And so uh, for a while, there was a minute where we might have said racism and colonialism because that was what was being said by the most advanced the thing is that once they said colonialism, for us, that, that solved the real problem. Once we begin to hear that, but then the racism and colonialism, that's the thing that represented a certain kind of contradiction. Because uh, it's like characterizing colonialism as the same thing uh, as racism. And that's not true. And you can't solve a colonial problem uh, you know, like that. The racism is just these ideas uh, that informs uh, 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 the uh, uh, oppressor, the colonizer, the settler, and what have you, uh, uh, and unites the, the colonizer, the settler, uh, the oppressor uh, with uh, the oppression. It um, arms and, inform and, and gives them leadership about attacking the colonized. That's, that's what it does. And it undermines also the consciousness of the, of the colonized. And so that I'm thinking that my problem is because white people don't like me. It's also something at the same time that places white people in the center of everything. So that the real problem of everybody in the damn world is because white people don't like them. That's the, that's the, I can't even imagine how at one time I was even able to entertain that thought because that's what it says. That everybody has a contradiction because of some kind of racism of the, of, of the opinion that white people have of us. Uh, and then we saw real concrete examples and we began to learn more and, and became materialist, you know, uh, conscious materialist, uh, informed uh, and educated materialist. And that's an ongoing process, of course. And I don't know if I can offer anything better than that, Comrade Olafin. Uhuru. Uhuru, Comrade Kefin. Yes, I do know that. It's your pastor. <laughs> I'm done sorry. in 1975. Your pastor done in 1975. 
colonialism, the major problem confronting Africans in the U.S. was a major breakthrough on that question that come at Hold up in it just right. Yes. Uh, and, and it really helped us to solve that problem. Yes, he's talking, uh, Kay Fing is mentioning a, a, a pamphlet written in 1975, but see, I'd already raised that question even uh, with Jomo, earlier on with Jomo, and we were struggling with how to distinguish, you know, like um, uh, the colony. I remember going through this question of the colony versus the ghetto, and, uh, and you know, like we were a colonized population, and. And so it's been something that we've been grappling with uh, uh, since the 1960s. And as Kay Fing mentioned, by 1975, and I'm sure that's not the first thing that we wrote and said on that. By 1975, we did the document, Colonialism, the Major Contradiction, or something like that, uh, facing African people in the United States. Was there somebody else who was going to say something? Did we? Uhuru Chairman. Uhuru. Uhuru. Uhuru Chairman, one yeah. of the things that we need to to mention and talk about too is the ideological contribution that that you you know that you made in terms of even talking about counterinsurgency. The first time we heard it applied to the movement was when you began to explain what happened to the Panthers as part of a counterinsurgency attack. Even Panthers themselves didn't sum it up in that way. So there's a lot of stuff, you know, primitive accumulation. There's a lot of contributions that ideological contributions. Um, that needs to be in this history. And Kamer Gaida was talking about the contributions they made around the whole question of counterinsurgency uh, regarding what happened to the African Revolution and is happening even as we have this discussion. And it's been interesting that you would uh, mention that because that was the basis for the creation of uh, NPDOM or first PDOM and then NPDOM. And then I'm looking at uh, something that we did in pamphlet form. Uh, it, it was printed in 19. Uh, uh, 91, but it responded to a conference uh, that we had uh, in 1990. I think you were there, Comrade Gaida, uh, at Freedom Summer in St. Petersburg, Florida, and the title of the pamphlet is The Dialectics of Black Revolution and the Struggle to Defeat the Counterinsurgency in the U.S. We led literally years long. When this, the, in the foreword for this document, it said something like, uh, we were engaged at this time in 1990 when the conference was held. Uh, for uh, uh, a, a struggle that we had been uh, to expose the counterinsurgency for, for five years at that time. So the counterinsurgency was a critical question. And we fought, 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 and some of the most important struggles that we had inside the African Liberation Movement revolved around this question of counterinsurgency. That's the thing that led to another um, uh, booklet that we published called uh, Black Power Since the 1960s, where we were engaged in serious struggle uh, uh, political struggle with the, uh, the, the people who upheld the politic of, uh, of the, of the five-state solution, that somehow Africans constitute a nation in five states in the United States South. And, and speaking of that, one of the proponents of that, when we first uh, uh, put forth the pamphlet that Kay Fing is talking about, uh, contacted us to say, well, yeah, we know it's colonialism, but we have to say it's racism because of how the masses understand or something to that uh, simple-minded uh, uh, effect. And uh, of course, that's a comrade we've been struggling with, used to struggle with for a long time, but uh, we don't do that anymore. Uh, Uhuru, Comrade Akile. Go ahead. Yes, Comrade Akile is uh, director. Akile has uh, told me to zip it. <laughs> Uhuru, never. <laughs> Uhuru. So let's just salute Chairman Amal Ashitella and all the comrades who participated in this discussion today. Uhuru, salute to all of these veterans on the call who are veterans of the party and the movement but continue um, in the struggle today. So I really want to salute you, comrades. Uhuru. And I heard Kay Fing, I heard Gaida, and I hear Chairman. Um, we got to keep this going. This is so important. And actually, um, comments are um, describing this study as one of the most dynamic and most important study um, um, Molly taught me studies to date. Ooh. So we got to keep it going. Um, and I want to appreciate everyone who has been watching online, who stayed with us, um, and you know, especially because we went, you know, over time and just really that, but that explains the significance of this discussion that people are watching, um, you know, saluting the party everywhere we are on Facebook and on YouTube and all of your engagement. We, I know everybody um, had people who have had questions and things like that. 
the Office of the Chair um, will be, you know, contacting you and uh, making sure that the Chairman does see your questions. So, um, you know, we just really appreciate you guys. And keep sharing this study. Share it, like it. Um, bring your family and friends next time to this discussion um, and continue to share this video widely. Um, and this study was brought to you by the Department of Agitation and Propaganda, Winning the War of Ideas. For your worldwide revolutionary news and analysis, visit theburningspear.com. For Revolutionary Radio, dynamic shows, and music by Africans all around the world, tune in to Black Power 96.3 FM. Broadca we have a radio. We have a whole radio station <laughs> to which we broadcasted this entire discussion. See um, what you did, Vince Lunch. <laughs> See what you did. <laughs> and um, we are broadcasting out of St. Petersburg, Florida, but we are accessible via the Black Power 96 app for Apple and Android or online at blackpower96.org. Did you unite with what you heard today and want to learn more about how you can get involved with the African People's Socialist Party? Visit APSPUhuru.org for all information regarding how you can apply. In fact, we saw people asking how can they join in this discussion, and we will get to you, making sure we bring you in. Um, join the Freedom Mass Choir and Band. The Freedom Mass Choir and Band is an all-African community group of singers and instrumentalists that sing songs of resistance and revolution. Members are located throughout the United States and attend weekly rehearsals both in person and via live stream and video. Sign up by emailing blackpowerchoir at gmail.com or call 727-537-6736. This December, Uhuru Foods and Pies is calling on you to come to Oakland, California, or St. Petersburg, Florida, to be a part of baking and selling 10,000 Uhuru Pies to support the programs of the Black Power Blueprint. Uhuru Pies is a 37-year-old loved progressive tradition in California and Florida. From December 20th to 24th, brigades will meet at the Aquaba Hall for overviews and summations, be out in the community selling Uhuru Pies, including the signature Uhuru Sweet Potato Pie, baking, phone banking, and winning people to support black self-determination and reparations to Black Power Blueprint. We need you to be a part of selling pies at 12 pop-ups, um, some that have already occurred, followed by our reparations for um, Black Power Blueprint dinner. Oh, that's already passed. So you guys can sign up for Huru Pies, um, selling 10,000 Huru Pies, getting involved in Oakland or um, St. Petersburg at ahurupies.org. December 9th to 16th, come cruise with us aboard the Marcus Garvey Legacy Cruise, a time for revolutionaries to kick back and relax. You'll be on board with Chairman Amalia Shatella while getting to enjoy the spoils of the ships. Destinations include Grand Cayman, Mahogany Bay, Belize, and Cozumel, Mexico. Get signed up today at ahurulegacycruise.org. There is still time. This cruise also serves as a fundraiser for the African Socialist International. December 22nd, the Burning Spear newspaper presents an interview with Chairman Amalia Shatella at 6 p.m. Eastern, live from the Burning Spear Facebook and YouTube page. This interview is being conducted as part of our month-long celebration of the 50th anniversary of the Burning Spear newspaper, founded in 1968. You can join the celebration by tuning into this webinar and get signed up for the December month-long Spear sales competition at theburningspear.com. And lastly, if you're local to St. Pete or St. Louis, at the Uhuru House, 3 p.m. Eastern here and 4 p.m. Central Time, the International People's Democratic Uhuru Movement will be hosting our Black Power Sunday rallies. In St. Pete, this rally will be centered around black community control of education, where we will be conducting the soft launch of the Amalia Shetela Resource Library, Library. It is a free event packed with dynamic presentations, food, and an in-person look at historical artifacts from our party. Thank you all for tuning in. Thank you to all of our guests who participated in this discussion today. Thank in Kenya. Oh, thanks to MCAS in Kenya, also a very young, dynamic African revolutionary woman in Kenya, organizing in Kenya um, and consolidating the, Afri the work of the African Socialist International. Um, so salute to all the comrades who participated in this discussion today. Um, and thank you, and make sure you guys tune in to the next Omali Taught Me Sunday study. Uhuru. Uhuru.